everyone and welcome back to Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality. It's been a while, it's been a couple of months since we uh, last touched on the topic of um, Ivan IV Grozny, the formidable or the terrible, uh, but we're back now. I've noticed um, in the chat there have been you know, quite a few concerns as to uh, what this evening is. Well, unfortunately, um, we are not able to um, have the, the usual discussion portion, which would act as an addendum uh, to this lecture. So this entire episode, the um, 13th episode um, of Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality, The Rise of the Romanovs, is just going to be me speaking this evening, this lecture. So if you have any questions you want to bring up or, you know, super chats or whatever, um, this is really the only time to make them regards to this topic, because this topic will not be covered on the, uh, on the channel again. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that is the way it has to be. Uh, I'm very happy to um, uh, talk about this uh, subject this evening because it's something which is endlessly fascinating, strange, and yet has been, I'm not sure whether deliberately skipped over um, in, you know, most sort of English language sort of, um, you know, histories, popular histories or whatever. Uh, you know, for those who are familiar with um, the history of Russia, you'll no doubt know about Ivan the Terrible, and then there'll be this period where suddenly Peter the Great pops out of nowhere. Um, and then, of course, when we talk about the Romanovs, you know, colloquially in the West, you're really only referring to um, uh, the period in the uh, the 19th century and thereafter. But um, this time frame we're covering, the the time of troubles and the, the rise of the Romanov dynasty, in particular, this episode covering the first two uh, Romanov or Romanov Tsars is um, seldom ever uh, talked about in the in the English language and um, I think this is a wonderful time to really bring up the subject and I hate to um, necessarily date uh, this conversation but I hope given the um, the current predicament we're seeing between um, uh, NATO and Russia that perhaps you can draw some interesting parallels between what is going on today and what the Russians were dealing with some 400 years ago. Um, the parallels are really in many ways quite uncanny um, so maybe, you know, the more perceptive members of the audience can, um, can suss out what I'm really getting at there. Um, but really, this is the beginning of, you know, a, you could say a reinforcement of a, a distinct Russian nationality, uh, which had, you know, begun under Ivan IV, but then undergoes this, uh, this terrible reversal until um, the, the 1610s and the 1620s, where not only do we see the rise of the Romanovs, but really the rise of the Romanovs also coincides with the, the reascendancy of Russia, um, returning to that um, brief period of preeminence at the beginning of the reign of uh, Ivan IV, um, Ivan Grozny. So I'm very happy uh, to bring this subject to light uh, for many of you who may not have encountered it before. And of course, um, there are polls in the chat, I'm aware, who will um, no doubt be triggered by uh, the many sort of references to, uh, to Polish history uh, from the perspective of Russian history. So uh, uh, without further ado, uh, let us commence with the stream. I think just an, another note that um, even though it's missed in um, you know, a lot of sort of uh, uh, popular English language histories, uh, this period we're talking about, so the beginning of the 17th century, the end of the 18th century, is very much an iconic time in Russian myth, um, in Russian sort of um, myth, in Russian law, in Russian history, in terms of the Russians' understanding of themselves and how they can possibly contextualize what's going on now in terms which are very much sort of abounding in uh, 1610, 1613. Uh, so here we go. And just for um, for reference, uh, this is a conversation mainly about the Romanovs, but it's going to appear in the middle of the conversation as if I'm taking a massive detour uh, when discussing the uh, the time of troubles. But um, all of this is relevant to the topic, so uh, uh, do bear with me. And um, all of it is um, interesting. So um, so there you go. Now the. Romanov family rose from relative obscurity. The family, as we would come to know it, didn't really exist at all prior to the year 1500. And yet by 1613, they had established a dynasty that would rule the ever-expanding Russian Empire for 300 years. The earliest attested ancestor of the Romanovs was Andrei Kopya, a 14th century Muscovite boyar, um, who later genealogies placed as either a descendant of old Prussian royalty or um, Novgorodian nobility, which um, very much is uh, probably a later revision, um, considering that uh, the Kobia family had very humble origins. I mean, it's essentially a nickname 
um, referring to an equerry or a page or someone who um, had descent from a, 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 um, a master of horses or a grand equerry. Um, so uh, not very distinguished origins, considering many of the Russian families could um, uh, claim some sort of link with Rurik, the, uh, uh, the great sort of founder of, um, of the Russian sort of nation state. Eventually, this uh, this Boyar clan they changed their name to uh, the Russian equivalent of um, of Cat, um, and then eventually to uh, uh, Zakarin or, or, or Zarin. And this family split off into the uh, uh, the Yakolev and the Yuri branches of the family. And now the eponymous founder of the Romanov dynasty, one Roman Sakhalin Yuryev, belonged to this junior branch, and very little is known about him, other than the fact that he sired Nikita Romanovich, Daniel, Anna, and Zarista Anastasia Romanova, and held the rank of um, Okolnishi, meaning essentially to be close to. Um, as part of the uh, Manichaswo system, the, the old table of ranks, um, to be a uh, a Kornishi uh, was considered to be a stepping stone to the rank of Boyar, uh, above the rank of a uh, Stolnik, meaning essentially a cupbearer. bearer. Um, despite being below the rank of Boyar, however, and a Kornishi often had um, overlapping duties, uh, the right to participation as a prikas or a chancellor or officer of state, um, or in the specific case of, uh, of, of Roman, uh, he was a Vovoda, which essentially means um, regimental chief. And um, it would later come on to have an association with um, with warlord or prince. Uh, but in this um, context, it literally just means a, um, a officer within the army. Now, Roman died in 1543 uh, when his daughter Anastasia, fated to change the fortunes of the dynasty, was only 13. Now, I want to go on to this um, this topic of the, the bride show, the Russian bride show, a lingering element of influence and imitation from Byzantium and Russian court life. The bridal show dates back to around the 8th century when um, Maria of Amnia was chosen as the consort of Constantine the, the VI, the Byzantine emperor. Um, the Byzantine tradition actually predates other famous bridal showers, such as those of the, the Song dynasty, um, going all the way to the end of the Qing dynasty. Um, the Chinese tradition only starts around the year 1000. The Byzantines have um, uh, preceded that tradition by around um, 200 years. However, as with as is so much of the case, linking this back to earlier streams, uh, all of these um, intricate customs and traditions uh, were lost around the time of the sack of Constantinople in 1204, and it wasn't um, later resurrected by the uh, the restored imitation Byzantine Empire after 1261. The system of the bridal shower was introduced into Russia with the reign of the first titular Tsar Ivan III through the influence of his um, uh, Paleologus Byzantine wife, Sophia. As it is very unlikely that Sophia, or indeed any of the Paleologus dynasty, had any familiarity or practice of this um, old Byzantine custom, uh, Sophia was no doubt hearkening back to ancient Byzantine traditions to cement Moscow as the third Rome. But there were other considerations. Now the Tsar was a Caesar and an Orthodox Caesar. He found himself above the various um, Western invariably Catholic princes of the blood royal. Moreover, Imperial Muscovy from around um, the same time had begun separating the women of the court from the men, secluding them in the terim, um, shielded from public view. Often the, um, the terim in various noble houses in the Kremlin uh, would be this uh, small attic room uh, above. And uh, again, the idea was um, a complete seclusion and that um, uh, men could not gaze upon the, the aristocratic women of the court. And this, again, is um, very much a system imported from the, the older um, Byzantine gynecaeum. Now, the bridal shower was thus a novel means of introducing the Tsar to potential spouses around the limitations of the Terem seclusion, while also hearkening back to the legacy of Byzantium and ingratiating the Tsar with the nobility of Russia, whose daughters were now eligible, eligible to become Tsarista. In 1547, Anastasia Romanova was presented to Tsar Ivan IV from around a thousand potential candidates and was selected as the Tsar's wife. Now the obscure Zakharin Yuryev family were part of the imperial family. 
their 13 years of marriage, this being Anastasia to Ivan IV, is often considered the golden age of Ivan IV, with many histories crediting the Tsarista as having a moderating influence on Tsar's rage. Alone of the Tsar's eight wives, or sometimes six wives, Anastasia gave him um, three legitimate sons, Dmitri, Ivan, and Fyodor. It is also through her that we receive the name Romanov from Romanova, meaning daughter of literally daughter of Roman. For although she was not the progenitor of the dynasty, that honor would belong to her brother Nikita Romanov. Um, the Romanovs consciously styled themselves after Anastasia rather than Nikita to emphasize their link with the their association with the imperial royal family. So they should technically be called Romanovich, but um, instead they adopt the um, title Romanova to associate themselves with Anastasia, the, the first, the great wife of, um, of Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny. And um, in terms of you know, how this actually helps the family, well, obviously the dynasty founder died before he could see his daughter um, married into the, uh, to the Danilovich Rurikid clan. Um, but uh, Daniel Romanovich is made um, very quickly made a boyar or confirmed in that rank. Um, but he, you know, dies rather prematurely. So really, we're looking at um, Nikita, uh, the younger brother. Um, Nikita is appointed as a Eridna or a, a bodyguard to Ivan the Fourth, and we know that he participated at the uh, the siege of Kazan, um, the great military expedition of Ivan the Fourth. And from 1559, he was confirmed uh, with this um, title, which belonged to his father of um, Olnish, o o Olnishi, uh, you know, the, the stepping stone on the way to Boyar. And with the death of his um, uh, elder brother, uh, he assumes the leadership of the, of the House of Romanov. This is also uh, two years after his sister's death. Uh, so he is now elevated to the rank of Boyar. And after the, uh, the death of Ivan IV, he very briefly um, assumes the, uh, the rank of Regent of Russia, being the grandfather of the new Tsar, or sorry, or rather the, the uncle of the new Tsar. And he's also at this time, one of the, the largest landowners in Russia. So from very obscure origins, and again, almost, this is essentially the result of luck. It's interesting to see how um, history would have changed if um, Ivan IV didn't find Anastasia Romanova particularly enticing during that um, that bridal show. I hate to sort of um, uh, reduce um, major historical trends and, um, moments due to these sort of moments of chance but in the particular case of the actual elevation of the Romanov dynasty uh, this uh, chance meeting the bridal shower really did transform the prospects of a unremarkable royal house from again just a, a family of gentlemen an equestrian family uh, to one of the most powerful uh, families in Russia uh, within the span of a single reign within the span of the reign of Ivan the fourth now, the last lecture of um, Orthodoxy, Autoxy and Nationality um, ended with the death of Ivan. Um, um, by, by this, I mean Ivan Ivanovich, the Tsarevich. So I'll just repeat this for the benefit of those who um, haven't listened or need a reminder. Tsarevich Ivan, the son of Tsar Ivan and Anastasia Romanova, began to question his father's failures in the Livonian Wars after the fall of Venden in 1578. And of course, the Livonian Wars were the uh, massive ongoing struggle uh, of Russia to claim a major port in the Baltic against the Danish, the Polish, and indeed the Swedish, and the subsequent siege of Skoff. In 1581, uh, the Tsar physically assaulted Tsarevich Ivan's pregnant wife, Yelena um, Sheremeteva, over her, supposedly over her offensive manner of dress, although this is a, a moment in Russian history, which is again, uh, the, the events are shrouded and we aren't, nothing here is conclusive. The assault in all likelihood led to the miscarriage of her child. The Tsarevich confronted his father, only in turn to be accused by his father of inciting rebellion, causing Tsar to strike the Tsarevich with his imperial scepter, mortally wounding his son, causing the Tsar to cry out, May I be damned, for I have killed my son. Praying for a miracle, the Tsarevich died four days later. The effect of this was that after Ivan Grozny's death, Russia was left without a capable heir, the heir was now the mentally incompetent Fyodor, and as you can see, this is, this moment is a mortalized with um, Ilya Repin's uh, painting of the latter half of the 19th century. Fyodor had married um, uh, Irina Gud uh, Gudanova, who I've um, uh, included on the right here, a member of a powerful Boyar family. In 1570, Boris Gudanov, her brother, 
had married Maria, the daughter of Maliuta Skutarov, the most infamous of the Oprichnini agents of Ivan IV, essentially the Tsar's chief enforcer, who was also responsible for the murder of um, uh, Metropolitan Philip. After Skutarov's death in 1573, the Gudinov family steadily established a power base during the final years of Ivan IV's reign. Theodore succeeded his father in 1584, Although a pious ruler, Theodore had no grasp of politics and spent most of his time indulging his favourite hobby, campanology, bell ringing. After a two-year regency led by Nikita Romanov, the Tsar's only uncle died and Boris Gudinov's, um, Gudinov, Theodore's brother-in-law, positioned himself as the real power in Russia throughout the remainder of his reign. So in many ways, this represents a Romanov full start. It appeared at one point that uh, the Romanovs were to become the uh, the greatest power in Russia and potentially uh, succeed uh, Fyodor as Tsar. Uh, but of course, this does not happen. Instead, um, the, momentum, the momentum of the Russian political system uh, is built behind uh, the now regency of Boris Gudinov. Perhaps the most significant policy undertaken by Gudinov was to abandon Ivan IV's ambitious foreign policy to dominate Baltic trade and form an alliance with England. Under the regency of Gudinov, the Russo-English Entente was ended. Nevertheless, Gudinov, despite attempts to supplant him, was considered a prudent governor, dealing with the aftermath of Ivan's costly wars of the Baltic and the vulnerability of the southern border. Um, which was susceptible to Moscow Tatar raids, of course, during the uh, latter period of Ivan IV's reign in 1571. Uh, Moscow had been burnt to the ground as a result of a, reign of, uh, a raid conducted by Crimean Tatars. To restore Russia's prestige after the humiliating peace of Plusa that had ended the Livonian Wars in 1583, just one year prior to Ivan IV's death, Gudinov prosecuted a local war with Sweden that resorted uh, that uh, resulted in Russia's uh, Baltic possessions lost under Ivan IV being returned to Russia. Uh, this wasn't a great victory, but more or less it was trying to restore the uh, flagging position of, um, of Russia after the, uh, the exhaustion and the setbacks of the Livonian War. So um, Boris Gudinov isn't able to completely reverse uh, the setbacks encountered in the late reign of Ivan IV, but he's able to um, uh, hold Russia together and ensure it holds on to some element of international prestige and retain, pivotally, that access to the Baltic Sea. Under Gudinov, Tobolsk was founded, so beginning the real colonization of Siberia. While he established Kremlin cities across the south to defend them from Tatar raids, including Samara, Saratov, Voronezh and Tsaritsyn, and anyone familiar with Russian um, uh, geography knows the significance of those, um, those Kremlin towns. Gudinov cemented the progression towards Russian serfdom, begun during the time of the Africhnina also. It had been the custom on St. George's Day, or, or in Russia, Yuri's Day, for a peasant to transfer to another landlord if he so wished. Essentially, it was a, a general liberty to, um, to mark the occasion of uh, Russia's patron saint, because, of course, St. George was the patron saint of Russia. The peasant was now bound to the land, however, as Gudinov revoked that ordinance in an attempt to curry favour with the boyars, whose you know, authority he, he was constantly sort of desperately in search of. Gudinov completed the, pro uh, the process begun by Metropolitan Macarius during the early reign of Ivan IV, and finally Moscow was elevated to the Patriarchate, uh, cementing the city's position as an imperial capital and successor to Constantinople, whose patriarch was still under the control of the Ottoman Sultan. Achieving the independence of the Russian church was perhaps the only enterprise in which both Tsar and his regent worked in tandem. There was only one possible heir during the reign of Theodore, his half-brother Dmitri of Uglich. Even had Dmitri survived, his succession would have been extremely controversial, as he was the son of Maria Nagaya, a marriage which the Russian Orthodox Church refused to recognise, and thus Dmitri was technically illegitimate. Dmitri died in 1591 at the age of eight, and his mother was quick to claim that the boy had been murdered. Nagaya's claim led to a lynch mob pursuing 15 supposed assassins, including the uh, Diak, or the Moscow representative in Uli. Nagaya was subsequently forcibly tonsured as a nun, and of course this is a standard practice when dealing with your enemies in order to avoid executing them. The mystery of Dmitri's death is in large part the result of the investigation and subsequent machinations of Vasily Shisky, later briefly Tsar of Russia. In his initial investigation, Shisky concluded 
the Tsar had accidentally, rather the uh, the prince Dmitri had accidentally inflicted a mortal wound, stabbing himself in the throat, which some future historians would claim was the result of an epileptic seizure. Later, Shuisky would claim that the boy had been assassinated on the orders of Boris Gudinov. This murder myth looms large in 19th century Russian historiography uh, pertaining to this period. It is no surprise that most people uh, were acquainted with this topic in the 19th century through Pushkin's Boris Gudinov, first performed in 1866, and followed by an opera of the same name by Modest Mazolsky. And I do advise um, uh, you do check out both of those in particular. Um, uh, the Mazolsky opera is, um, is quite a good introduction into, um, into Russian opera, and indeed um, uh, the sort of the Russian music um, created by the five. In both iterations, Gudinov is responsible for the death of Dmitri, which ultimately leads to his undoing. The reason being that Gudinov had apparently always covered the throne. Credit is now typically given to the findings of the first, in, uh, first investigation that exon exonerated Gudinov. And, and again, I think it's just important to note that um, all of this pertains to the, uh, the incredibly fraught political climate in the, the early 17th century in Russia. Um, had Gudinov attempted, you know, to to, to kill uh, Dmitri, uh, that would have meant he was planning uh, to usurp the throne, or um, uh, at a time where it didn't look as if you know, Fyodor was, um, you know, going to die without an heir, uh, whom he could essentially rule through. Um, so this idea of going all the way back to um, to fifteen ninety one, so this is seven years before the Tsar Fyodor would die, uh, that he was al already planning to um, to take the throne at this point is uh, very implausible. Um, nevertheless, it um, was very convenient for those um, wanting to uh, uh, take over from the Gudinov dynasty uh, to harken back to this. And of course, we're going to see uh, one of the strangest episodes of Russian history when we come to the the, the false Dmitris, but I haven't quite got there. Irina Gudinova was now under extreme pressure to produce an heir. Although married since 1580, it is possible that the marriage was consummate, wasn't, was, um, wasn't consummated for a decade. For despite Irina's influence over her husband, he was thoroughly disinterested in sex. A child finally came in 1592, a daughter, Theodosia, who died two years later. When Theodore died in 1598, the Danilovich dynasty, which had ruled Moscow and then Russia for 300 years came to an end. This was not, as is commonly claimed, the end of the Rurikid dynasty, or even their stint as czars, as the Shuisky family were Rurikids. Perhaps the most prominent Rurikid branch of the family thereafter was the, um, the house of Dol uh, uh, Dolkorukov, having a far more illustrious heritage than the Romanovs, claiming descent from St. Michael of Chernigov. They would play a major role in Russian history until the murder of Vasily Dolkorukov alongside Nicholas II in the House of Special Purpose in Ekaterinburg. Immediately after the death of Fyodor, Irina attempted to take power in Russia, expressing her intention to receive oaths of loyalty from the boyars um, to her as a great sovereign or Gosuda Gospoda. Uh, she ruled for nine days in the confusion, even declaring a general amnesty for prisoners, which had become somewhat of a universal custom upon the beginning of a new reign. This isn't just a, a universal custom for Russia. This is um, something that a lot of medieval monarchs practiced. The assumption was that um, when you were giving a general amnesty to prisoners, you weren't um, uh, just giving it to violent criminals, but rather um, you were giving it to any sort of potential political prisoners uh, which had been locked up under the reign of your predecessor. So the idea of amnesty upon a new reign was always sort of the idea of you know, starting a new beginning. And the fact that um, she took it upon herself uh, herself to uh, engage in this sort of behavior uh, really does mark her, indicate the level of ambition she had, uh, not only for a woman uh, to become a czar, which was you know unprecedented at this point, uh, but also the fact that she had virtually no claim to the throne other than Judea uh, Exordis uh, by right of um, by right of marriage. Uh, so this, of course, was incredibly contentious, and she had to step down in the face of a general revolt against what was considered to be a shameless usurpation of power. Of course, this um, idea of a, a female Gospuda or great sovereign would uh, rear its head again when we talk about um, Sophia, the regent of Peter the Great. And of course, Russia will finally get its um, first acknowledged Tsarista um, uh, to, to rule in her own right, Catherine I, the, uh, uh, the spouse of uh, Tsar Peter the Great. <clears throat> 
As Boris had a proven, Boris Gudunov had a proven record in government, he was the obvious choice of Tsar, with a tenuous link to the Danilovich dynasty as the Tsar's brother-in-law. Now, this is where I'm going to, you know, stand up for Boris a bit and um, try and try and understand the nature of what it is to take power in that sort of climate. Um, in my view, uh, Boris had no choice but to take power. Um, if you were in that position, which Boris has essentially run Russia uh, for the previous 15 years, um, and given his link to the previous dynasty, uh, had he decided to step down and say, for example, allowed um, uh, Fyodor Romanov, the oldest son of Nikita, uh, to become Tsar, in all likelihood, uh, he would have been tonsured and possibly assassinated. And to indicate this, you can say that the uh, the unanimous election of um, uh, Boris Gudunov by the Zemsky Sobor in 1598 uh, was a false start for the Romanovs, uh, because Fyodor Romanov, who later becomes known as Filaret, uh, steps down. He allows for the, the election of Boris Gudunov, and the election is unanimous. And this is also supported by the Patriarch of Constantinople, who has a significant um, influence over events. Uh, Job was the, or Job was the uh, Patriarch at the time, uh, but of course, how did uh, Boris Gudunov reward his um, <laughs> the loyalty of uh, of of, of Fyodor uh, Romanov? Um, he used an incredibly flimsy pretext: um, the lack of consent for uh, Fyodor's marriage to one uh, Ksenia uh, Shestova of the powerful Sotikov family, um, to essentially declare that he had committed treason, even though, again, this was before he became Tsar. This was in around um, 1595. Uh, he chose to marry uh, uh, Ksenia Shestova, so he wasn't even Tsar then. He was a regent, so he was retroactively assigning himself powers um, uh, he didn't have to justify the incredibly dubious purge of a main political rival, the head of the House of Romanov. Um, and as a result of this, he was um, both he and his wife uh, we were forcibly tonsured. Uh, in the case of um, uh, now, uh, Theodore adopts the title of Filaret as a monk um, in the Antoniev Monastery. And um, he's essentially kept under um, a lock and key and um, is watched. And he's only released six years later when uh, the Gudnov family, uh, rather five years later, when the Gudnov family fall from power. Um, the Tsar's son, or rather, sorry, Filaret's son, uh, the future Tsar Michael, the first Romanov Tsar, um, had been born at this point, and he would um, come to live with his mother, uh, Ksenia Shestova, um, due, you know, as, as part of her monastic um, incarceration. Um, despite this, there are a couple of things to note. One is the fact that the Zemsky Sobor, which had just been created by Ivan IV some 40 years earlier, as a rubber stamp institution to ensure, again, this idea of um, consensus, you have all the estates present, and um, you rule for an institution representing the estates, um, in this case, the, the Semsky Sobor, the Great Council. Um, because now the, now the main the dynasty, the Danilovich dynasty, which had ruled for 300 years, had come to an end, uh, this institution, along with the support of the patriarch, uh, was seized upon as the means of acquiring legitimacy for an entirely new dynasty to take power, in this case, the Gudunov dynasty. Now, Boris's um, reign was considered pragmatic, and he's one of the uh, first rulers very much cognizant of the disparity between East and West in terms of technological development. Um, he permits the construction of Lutheran churches in Russia, uh, bringing into Russia a steady supply of educated Lutheran Germans. To normalize relations with Sweden after his successful war, Boris attempted to marry himself and his children to the Swedish House of Vasa, though this was unsuccessful. It is around this time that Sigismund III Vasa of Poland expressed an interest in the Russian throne after he was deposed in Sweden. And that, now this leads to the rather um, uh, confusing situation where um, both Sweden and uh, Poland, Lithuania, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and I, I do um, apologize to any Lithuanians in advance, that I will be using um, Poland as a, as, a short, as a shortcut rather than just Poland, Lithuania all the time. Uh, so do forgive me. But um, when talking about this, this is essentially uh, two branches of the same family, the House of Vasa, which had originated with um, Gustav Vasa's revolt against uh, the Kalmar Union. Um, Sigismund had been elected uh, to the throne of Poland, and he was a, um, a, devout, a devout Catholic, which, considering the uh, main Swedish branch of the family were Protestant, obviously was a main source of contention. So much so that in 1599, uh, he was deposed um, when he inherited the throne of Sweden as well. 
So now we have a Protestant branch of the House of Vasa in Sweden, and we have a very much Catholic, uh, zealously Catholic branch of the family uh, operating in Poland, Lithuania. Uh, very much you can probably consider Sigismund the, the third as the um, as the Polish equivalent of um, Ferdinand II, the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor at that time. So not only are they, you know, there's this dynastic strife going on between Sweden and Poland, uh, there's this religious strife, but also there is a, there are various territorial disputes, especially over the uh, the Livonia, Ingria, and of course, Russia. And this is going to inform uh, events going forward. So we already see that Boris Gudinov has inherently a lack of legitimacy, as he's not a member of the Danilovich dynasty. And um, to make matters worse, his reign is rather short. He only reigns for um, for around six years, uh, not really long enough to establish a um, <laughs> a strong dynasty. Uh, but in fairness to him, I, I think the his demise is is the result of events which are you know mainly out of his control, uh, namely the 1601 to three uh, Russian famine which was one of the worst ever famines to hit Russia and killed off about 2 million Russians, which to put this in perspective was around a third of the population at that time. It was really rather devastating. Uh, and where the government was active in cities doling out food, um, impoverished peasants then fled to the cities, only increasing the severity of the crisis as rural Russia was now left desolate and essentially empty. And this is where we have the, the great piggybacking of this general crisis of the discontented nobles who are suddenly bringing up issues with the um, the legitimacy and the election. Um, among the, the main instigators of this are the, uh, the Shuiskis and the Golitsyns. Of course, um, as our Boris Gudinov has already dealt uh, mainly with the issue of the Romanovs, albeit uh, Filaret has a younger brother, Ivan, uh, who will play a, a major role going forward. And of course, in in sort of Russian history, uh, when you are seen as a unfit czar or a, um, a czar usurper, um, it's not just that you are, you know, a usurper, you also become the Antichrist. This is also a um, an epithet which was given to Peter the Great uh, when he embarked upon his uh, uh, his rather rabid campaign of um, westernization. So he wasn't just a false czar, a fake czar, but he was also the Antichrist. And of course, this is going to um, inform the uh, uh, the religious rebirth um, going into the uh, the Raskol and the uh, the Nikitin reforms uh, when the Romanovs come in. Despite all of this, it wasn't clear who would succeed him if um, the Gudnov dynasty was going to be um, uh, usurped. Um, it was very unlikely that his son could um, successfully um, succeed him, given that um, all of the issues with legitimacy also pertained um, to the son. And this is also a time where rumours are resurfacing about the death of Dmitri, uh, Dmitri of Uglish. And, and again, this is the uh, the son of the sixth wife of um, Ivan the Terrible, and therefore technically an illegitimate son. But nevertheless, he ostensibly would have a better claim than Boris Gudinov. So not only does this cast dispersions on Gudnov's legitimacy, but here we enter into one of the strangest periods in Russian history, where it was claimed um, uh, that you know, Dmitry Vuglish had in fact survived um, an assassination attempt, producing no less than three false Dmitries from 1603 until 1612. And I've also had it mentioned that there was possibly a fourth uh, person claiming to be uh, the the almost assassinated Dmitry Vuglish, but um, we'll go into this. The first of these uh, false Dmitries visited the Patriarch Job around the year 1600. Uh, he was considered of appropriate age and extensive and inexplicable learning unless he was in fact um, educated as a potential Tsarevich. Uh, the boy claimed to have been smuggled out by his mother and kept in uh, kept in hiding through various monasteries. Um, as a result of this, Gudinov ordered him questioned, and in response to this, the uh, the false Dmitri fled to Poland. Another possible explanation was that this Dmitri was in fact the illegitimate son of the King of Poland Lithuania, uh, Stefan Batori. In 1605, a group of disaffected Russians, Cossacks, and German mercenaries invaded Russia in support of this first false Dmitri. Though Sigismund III tacitly supported the invasion of Dmitri's um, uh, of, of Dmitri, uh, material support came from and do forgive my uh, my Polish pronunciation, uh, the Vizno uh, Vieki family of Polish uh, Polish Ruthenia, modern day Ukraine. 
to gain papal support, Dmitri at the Polish court in Krakow publicly converted to Catholicism at Easter in 1604, gaining the support of the papal nuncio Rangio, uh, Rangoni and with him Jesuit support. He then formed an alliance pact uh, with the uh, Minichev uh, family, promising them rights to most major towns in the west of Russia, um, including Smolensk, uh, Skov and Novgorod. In that same year, uh, Boris Gudunov also died, having reigned again for only six years. Uh, the young Tsar Fyodor II Gudunov and his mother were then murdered by Dmitri's agents and supportive buyers as the false Dmitri entered Moscow to popular acclaim and with the defection of the army. Then having um, supposedly, uh, you know, met his, uh, uh, met, well, rather not supposedly, having met his supposed mother, um, Maria Nagaya, uh, Maria Nagaya then confirms him as uh, as her son but of course um that that is in no way sort of legitimation of this rather for maria nagaya uh, this could very much have been a again a political seizure of power in the sense that um you are an imposter now your entire claim to the throne because this is a remarkable situation where a imposter um takes over russia and rules for 10 months um in this instance um it is incumbent upon maria nagaya um, to legitimate this imposter um, in return for gaining a massive amount of um, sway and power over the new czar um, after, you know, two decades of relative obscurity. The Shwiskis, the Golitsyns, and the Romanovs that had opposed Gudunov were now allowed to return to Russia. Job was forced into exile, and Dmitri would appoint one uh, uh, Fyodor Romanov as Metropolitan of Rostov, and he would later become Patriarch. And this is... Um, Again, the conduit we're going to see with the Romanovs later. And um, in order to stabilize his reign, the St. George's Day privilege of the peasants was restored. Nevertheless, Dmitri's reign soon unraveled. Having resorted to killing the, uh, the Gudunovs, uh, Dmitri then kept Prince Xenia Gudunov as an unwilling concubine, essentially raping her. It soon became apparent that he was planning to radically modify Russian foreign policy to align with the goals of Poland and the papacy. The bulk of his support came from the Polish nobility. Indeed, the conditions of his ascension meant that vast tribute and rights to various towns and, um, and places were now given to his Polish backers. When his marriage between Dmitri and Marina uh, uh, Minizevich uh, came, she refused to convert orthodoxy, as was the practice. Um, essentially, you know, whenever you married um, into the Russian royal family, and this was a practice that continued right up until um, Nicholas II and Alexandra, um, not only did the uh, the princess marrying into the Russian royal family convert, but often adopted a new name. Uh, this didn't happen, cementing the fears of the Russian population that Dmitri was planning, along with Pope Paul V, the unification of the Russian and the Catholic churches, essentially forcing Catholicism onto Russia. Vasily Shuisky, who had been instrumental in the deposition of the Gudunovs, positioned himself as the defender of orthodoxy against Catholics and indeed the German Lutheran mercenaries who were now given rights to pray in orthodox churches. Shuisky declared that Dmitri was planning to orchestrate a massacre in Moscow using his Polish agents. Although this was almost certainly a lie, it nevertheless worked in precipitating a storming of the Kremlin. Dmitri jumped from a window, surviving, only to be killed by the crowd below. When the, new, when the new Tsar Vasily Shrisky disbanded the mercenaries of Dmitri, they looted Moscow, essentially of a lack of pay, and uh, Shrisky's own election was um, very much contested. Um, even though the Sobor, so the Zemsky Sobor, essentially the only organization with any legitimacy to name a new, um, uh, a new dynasty, had elected uh, uh, Vasily Shrisky, now Vasily IV, um, the Russian autocracy, uh, which had been the subject of the previous conversation, orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality, um, had all but evaporated. Um, the Commonwealth nobles, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth nobles that Dmitry had invited into Russia, were now an established fact in Russian politics, as were their Lutheran German mercenaries. The death of Dmitry had precipitated a general collapse as Russia entered into civil war. In the south, there was a major Tatar rebellion headed by Ivan uh, uh, Bolotnikov. Not even in Moscow was Vasily IV's authority universally recognized. Russia became now a peripheral concern in the larger feud between the Polish and Swedish branches of the House of Vasa. Sigismund III again supported a second false Dmitri, who was confirmed as Dmitri by Marina, the, uh, the widow of the, the first false Dmitri. Faced with imminent deposition, 
Vasily IV concluded an unfavorable alliance with the Swedes, ceding to them Russian territory in return for the support of a Swedish expeditionary force. At one point, the Second Dmitri had amassed an army of some 100,000 men and elevated Fyodor Romanov, now known as Filaret, to Patriarch of Moscow, though at this time um, he was only an anti-Patriarch to the, uh, the recognized Patriarch Hermogenes. The turning point for the Second Dmitri came when Sigismund III began to wage a war of conquest in earnest. The Polish supporters of Dmitri fled to join their king. Dmitri was then killed by a Tatar noble. The Swedish-Russian army was defeated by the Poles at the Battle of Klutzen in July of 1610. Two weeks later, Schwiski um, was deposed by a group calling themselves the Seven Boyars, one of them being Ivan uh, Nikitovich Romanov, the brother of Filaret. The Poles were then invited by this um, Council of the Seven Boyars into Moscow, and the Tsar, uh, Tsar um, Vesely Schwiski, uh, was briefly tonsured and then sent to Krakow as a captive. A month later in August, Vladislav, son of Sigismund III, was invited by the Seven to become Tsar of Russia. And um, again, this is sort of indicating the, the height of um, Polish influence, the fact that the, the, the boyars of Russia were now inviting a, uh, a Polish prince uh, to, to rescue the, themselves from the anarchy which had been wrought in the previous years. Just change the slide, just forgot it here. Um, one condition of his reign was that the Polish princes preserve the Polish prince preserved orthodoxy, a condition he promptly abandoned when he attempted to convert Russia to Roman Catholicism. Against the support of the boyars, Hermogenes, the Muscovite patriarch, opposed the installation of Ladislaw. From the outset, he supported uprising against the Poles, refusing to be their puppet. Progressively, he was tonsured first, threatened with execution, and then starved to death when he blessed the volunteer army of Kuzma Minin and Prince Pujarski. Meanwhile, Sweden interpreted that Russia had abandoned her alliance by essentially forming this uh, this, this Polish pact through um, the son of Sigismund III, appointing his son essentially as king, and raised a third Dmitri in Avangorod, which is again the, uh, the, the first sort of attempt to establish a city on the Baltic, uh, to oppose Vladislav while gaining control of Ingria, cutting off Russian access to the Baltic altogether. By this time, there was effectively no Tsar. The Swedes occupied Novgorod and the Poles, Moscow, while Tatar raids in the south led to wholesale depopulation. In Moscow, order was maintained through terror, and in 1611, the Polish forces massacred 7,000 denizens of the city when there was the threat of revolt. And of course, in response, there was a major peasant uprising, but it was unsuccessful at dislodging the Polish forces in the Kremlin. It wasn't until late 1612, after two years of occupation, that the city was reclaimed by the Russians. With the Kremlin under siege, Prince Dmitry Pozharsky defeated a larger Polish relief army at the Battle of Moscow. Unable to reach the Kremlin, the Polish garrison surrendered owing to lack of supplies in November. Rather than attempt to reconquer the city, Sigismund III Vasa, who was camped at uh, uh, Volkalamsk, which was uh, only a few kilometers away from Moscow, uh, returned to Poland, rather than forced to conquer the city again. With the Polish in retreat and Vladislaw's nominal reign over, uh, Dmitry uh, uh, Trubetskoy, together with Minin and Pozharsky, convened the so-called Zemsky government, basically a provisional government. With the capital liberated, now came the matter of electing a new Tsar who could end the time of troubles. So I just want to briefly recap, you know, bringing the Romanovs back into the situation. So after having risen to briefly the position of, um, of regent of Russia under Nikita Romanovich, uh, Fyodor Romanovich um, styles himself as Romanov after Anastasia Romanova, again to associate themselves with the uh, uh, their illustrious link with the, the Danilovich dynasty, the former imperial family. And um, he had essentially been um, removed from all positions of power and forced into a monastery along with his wife, uh, again for ostensibly committing treason, a false accusation of treason against Boris Gudinov. It isn't until 1605, after five years of essentially being imprisoned in the monastery, that um, uh, now Filaret, uh, formerly Fyodor uh, Romanov, is released by the false Dmitri under this idea of a general amnesty. And in 1609, he's essentially pressed by a second false Dmitri uh, to become the patriarch of uh, the patriarch of um, Moscow. And of course, as there is always uh, already Hermogenes, 
um, Filaret's authority as patriarch is only recognized in those territories which are you know, controlled by the Polish. However, when um, the Polish switch their allegiance from the second false Dmitri uh, to Sigismund's son, uh, Filaret refuses to acknowledge the, uh, the Polish king or the Polish prince as having any lordship over Russia. And as a result of this, um, he is essentially imprisoned. So at the same time, at the same time that Filaret is being imprisoned by the uh, the Polish for refusing to acknowledge um, uh, their claims as the Tsar of Russia, Ivan, uh, Filaret's younger brother, um, is one of the members of this council, bringing the Polish into Moscow willingly. In 1612, Hermogenes dies, and now Filaret is the only living prelate within the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, to have any sort of claim as being patriarch. Um, but of course, he's still in Polish captivity. Uh, there isn't a, another patriarch risen uh, to replace him. So for all intents and purposes, uh, he is the patriarch, albeit he can exercise no function as he is essentially a prisoner. Well, not, not essentially, he is <laughs> a prisoner of the, uh, of the Polish. And now coming to why the Romanovs, um, with the house of Gudunov gone and the Shwiski family disgraced, the house of Romanov was now the obvious choice uh, to be as, as to, to essentially succeed to the throne as a result of the uh, to succeed the Zemsky government, the Zemsky provisional government. Um, the election of the first Romanov Tsar is often associated with the end of the time of troubles, but I think that betrays how precarious their position is and how utterly remarkable um, the rise of um, power and really the stabilization of the Romanov dynasty uh, was in terms of its impact for Russia. Because at any point, um, it looked as if Michael was uh, just as ill, uh, <laughs> Ill disposed to uh, to rule over Russia as uh, Theodore had at you know, first appearances. At the Zemsky Sobol, the head of the house of Romanov Filaret, of course, who was um, also a patriarch, uh, was a Polish prisoner, so he couldn't feasibly become the Tsar of Russia. While Ivan, Filaret's younger brother, having again supported the, um, he'd, he'd turned around, he had supported the volunteer army, but as he had been tarred with this initial support for the, uh, for the Swedish, Ivan was also considered um, unsuitable to become Tsar. And so the seven, uh, so the, for the boyars and the Zemsky government turned to the only credible member of the Romanov family left, uh, which was Michael, uh, Patriarch Filaret's son, who lived with his mother, Ksenia, who was now known as um, Martha, the, the Grand Nun, at the Apatiev Monastery near um, Kostroma. Um, Michael is, again, a young, so he was only in his teens at this point, uh, possibly pliant, you know, again, in terms of the boyars controlling him, and with no association with any of the evaders or any of the, um, the previous uh, dynasties to rule uh, during the time of troubles, was, again, considered the, the perfect possible ruler and was elected unanimously. Martha at first protested, believing that an election and the elevation of her son would be an instant death sentence for her son. Um, because Michael was prone to illness, he was generally considered unremarkable, unintelligent, unable to become Tsar. And um, so at first, Martha tried to prevent her son uh, from becoming Tsar and eventually relented. After which, um, again, just in terms of how, how far Russia had fallen, it took weeks um, for him to be brought from Ipatiev uh, to the Kremlin uh, because of the, essentially, you know, the Kremlin had just previously been site of a siege and a battle. Uh, there was considered, you know, no possible dwellings in which the Tsar, the Tsar could live owing to the, uh, uh, the dilapidated state of the capital. So after several weeks and um, ensuring sort of uh, uh, tolerable lodgings for the new Tsar, uh, Martha finally relents and allows um, you know, her son to go to, to Moscow, albeit for the first um, seven years of his reign, uh, he is very much under the control of Martha's family, uh, the Saltikovs. However, it is through the influence of the Saltikovs that Russia finally concludes some form of peace uh, with Poland and Sweden um, after initially trying to gain those territories back by um, playing the two nations off each other. And what this essentially meant, what um, Russia gained for finally the spirit of peace with um, both Poland and Sweden was a considerable loss of territory. So as you can see on this map, the, uh, the, the shaded pink area um, on the east, uh, we see Smolensk, uh, we see Chernigov. I don't have it in the north, but Kexholm, which is then part of Finland um, and Ingria, all of these territories were ceded in order for Russia to gain peace. 
Um, so it wasn't a glorious peace by any means, but at last, you know, Russia had peace. Now on a quick tangent, despite the concessions in the West, Michael is ironically the Tsar who expanded Russia the most <laughs> through his patronage of the uh, Stroganov family in Siberia. Uh, we have no organized resistance from the Khan of Siberia from 1598 onwards. Uh, under Michael, the Russians established a presence in uh, 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 Krasnoyarsk by 1628, right in the center of Siberia, uh, before reaching Lake Baikal, uh, north of modern day Mongolia. And finally, the, uh, uh, the Emil River uh, bordering China. Um, and again, this is also the time where we see the, uh, uh, the, the rise of the Qing dynasty as well. So uh, China is expanding to the north and um, Russia is expanding eastwards. And um, by 1639, the Siberians finally um, reach uh, the Pacific Ocean and, you know, begin this, this massive wholesale consolidation of the entire sort of interior of northern Asia. After 1640, this region became known simply as Siberia beyond the confines of the old Khanate, which again only really refers to the um, uh, the western part of this territory. And the Tsar added the Tsar of Siberia to his many titles. Um, in terms of the actual effects on the indigenous population, when the Cossacks were attempting to take over this territory, uh, they would often respond violently. In some cases, we see um, accounts of Cossacks wiping out uh, you know, half of the number of various tribes, you know, all the way from um, uh the siberia all the way up to the um uh, to this region uh Kolmia, uh right in the east however when we see the progression of the cossacks we also see the progression of plague so when smallpox arrives it arrives in siberia in around the year 1630 and by 1680 around 50 percent of the indigenous population of siberia has been wiped out and across this entire region by about 1680 uh, only has a population of about 300,000, so um, ripe for uh, colonization by the Russians. Now quickly back uh, to the reign of Michael. Uh, through the influence of his uh, uh, prikazi or chancellor, um, Ivan Gromotin, uh, Filaret was finally released from Polish captivity. Underlying the weakness of Michael, um, who as a ruler was now 23, uh, well into his majority, Filaret returned as patriarch and removed um, his wife, Martha, and the Saltykovs from power. Filaret then went further and established a formal diarchy with his son. Effectively, he became Tsar in all but name, often acting without consulting his son, who showed extreme deference to his father. Filaret attempted to reverse the mass movement of peasants to the steppes, uh, where they became freebooters or Cossacks, effectively semi-autonomous militarized steppe communities in alliance with rather than de facto subjects of the Tsar. His solution was essentially more serfdom, wherein the peasants became more reliable taxpayers and military tenants while reforging those links with the nobility. By the 1630s, Russia built a capable army assisted by the importation of various foreign officers. The bridal show in abeyance since Ivan IV was restored for Michael, who had two wives. Through his second, uh, Eudosia, he produced an heir, Alexis, guaranteeing the preservation of the dynasty. And this is also a point of note. We, we talked about um, Fyodor had a relatively long reign uh, of around um, 14 years. Uh, and yet, you know, he produced one child who was a daughter. Uh, when the Tsar finally produced a, a son and heir, Alexis, who again, there was no guarantee that he was going to, um, to reach um, adulthood because of the high rate of infant mortality. Uh, the Tsar was 33 at this point and sickly. In fact, I think he only got married for the first time when he was 26. So um, throughout, you know, the, the majority of the reign of Michael, uh, we st still looms large the issue of the succession. Because if the Romanov dynasty were to fail, then Russia is thrown right back into that um, uh, terrible predicament with the uh, with the time of troubles. Um, but very fortunately for the Romanov dynasty, uh, against all the odds, the uh, the sickly and the unlikely Michael, uh, dominated by his father and his advisors, uh, produces a healthy um, young heir, Alexis, who will become Tsar Alexis the first of Russia, the second Romanov. By the time of um, Filaret's death in 1633, so this is um, the father, and he was 80 at this point, um, not only was his personal power at its zenith in Russia, but the constitutional powers of the patriarch had increased considerably to oversee not just the complete subservience of the various bishoprics all across Russia to the patriarch, but the massive expansion of seminaries and hence religious education to ensure um, orthodoxy among the clerics, 
but the patriarch's power after 1625 gave the patriarch the function as judge over secular matters, not just ecclesiastical ones, i.e. church matters. With his own expanded treasury and judiciary, whose headships were coveted by the most illustrious boyars, the patriarchate was effectively a state within the state. So again, this is just illustrating that Michael wasn't just um, allowing his father uh, to hold on to this joint rule as, you know, a, a temporary measure, uh, but my, but uh, Philaret was using this position to establish a considerable power base for the patriarchate, which um, is a major issue going forward. From 1633 to 45, Michael ruled as sole sovereign, but dependent on his chancellors, who continued to work for the pacification of Russia. Philaret had attempted to regain Russian territory with the new army, only for that policy to collapse with his death, confirming the status quo of 1619. So these borders, um, you know, more or less stay the same. And uh, Philaret again embarks upon this ambitious policy, uh, which is only again paid, to, you know, ended with his death um, in 1633, uh, which at the age of 80, I think is entirely understandable and expected. With a stable 30-year reign and a healthy heir to succeed, the Romanovs under Michael had successfully ended the time of troubles. It should also be noted that in addition to a riding injury, which prevented the Tsar from walking towards the end of his life, Michael exhibited an unusual hereditary form of scurvy prevalent in the early Romanovs. Now on to, um, on to Alexis. Sorry, just give me a second. Here we are. The new Tsar, Alexis, was only 16 when he succeeded, and his mother's death followed only a month after the father. He was then placed under the care of his tutor, Boris Morozov. From the outset, it appeared that Morozov's rule would be benign, as he worked to reduce tensions with Poland and the Ottoman Empire, while limiting excessive court expenditure, much to the annoyance of the boyars. However, it appeared that Morozov had ambitions for total control over the Tsar. In 1647, the Tsar was to choose his spouse via the bridal shower, arranged by Morozov. Morozov had rigged the selection to favor Maria uh, Miloslavskaya, uh, while he would marry, well, Morozov would marry Maria's sister, Anna, thus bringing him into the Tsar's family. And for context, the, uh, the, the lecturer's um, uh, Morozov was um, in his late 50s at this point, <laughs> and he was marrying a, a print, essentially a teenager in order to, uh, to marry into the Tsar's family. In the event, the Tsar chose one Euphemia Fedorovna, um, which again completely sort of um, potentially unraveled uh, Morozov's plans. So rather than let his plans be overtaken by this, uh, Morozov had the, the young princess falsely diagnosed with epilepsy and thus disqualified from uh, being a, a suitable candidate and then used um, this false diagnosis of epilepsy to accuse the entire family of um, deception and therefore banishing uh, the princess and her family. Um, for attempting to deceive the Tsar. And so Maria was finally selected and uh, Morozov married Anna, securing this plan. By 1648, uh, Morozov had control over the Prakasi, again, the chancelleries, and used his power to reduce state salaries and introduce an unpopular salt tax, resulting in the salt riot of um, 1648. And the uh, and again, this was a moment that, you know, nearly shake, you know, very much shake the dynasty and um, almost caused uh, the the new um, Tsarista to have a, a miscarriage. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Alexis was able to solve the crisis by essentially instituting a fake exile for Morozov, uh, where he was gone for four months and then was allowed to return and exercise a significant influence on the Tsar's policy for, um, uh, you know, roughly 10 years until he dies in 1661. Uh, so he's not as um, conspicuous as he was before the salt riots. Um, nevertheless, he has a, a considerable influence over at least the early part of um, Alexis's reign. Uh, following the salt riots, there were also rebellions in, um, in Skov and Novgorod, uh, where Nikon, uh, Metropolitan Nikon, uh, was brought to the attention of the Tsar and made the new Patriarch of Moscow in 1652. Perhaps the most consequential of Alexis's domestic reforms, uh, again under the influence of Morozov, was the intensification of Russian serfdom, an ongoing process um, that had, you know, really begun with Ivan IV. With the Code of Laws in 1649, serfs were allocated to estates, and in 1658 forbidden to leave. The landowner now had the right to all the serf's property, and only the landowner could transfer a serf. This policy was now applied retroactively, meaning all serfs who had fled in the 30 years prior to this new law had to be returned. 
While the policy of serfdom reduced agricultural output due to, again, the serfs having very little motivation uh, to improve their land, uh, the nobles were now dependent on the Tsar to uphold their rights over the serfs. With serf revolts like that of the, uh, the Stepan Razin revolt in 1670, the Tsar was essentially responsible for crushing that rebellion and executing the perpetrators. So essentially, the, um, the nobility of Russia, the boyars, gave up their right to contest the Tsar's authority um, in favor of these um, you know, tens of thousands of serfs and control over all of this land. So uh, remarkably, we have the, in, in, the, the instituting of Russian serfdom and the end of feudalism and the restoration of Russian autocracy, which is essentially the, um, the polar instance that we see, uh, the polar opposite of the instance we see in Poland at the same time. Uh, throughout his early reign, Alexis continued to build up the military, uh, a process which had begun, of course, under his grandfather, Philaret, um, profiting from an abundance now of unemployed military advisors following the end of the Thirty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. It was during the reign of Alexis that Russian troops first engaged Persian troops over the control of the Caucasus, beginning a 200-year struggle for control of that region that would only be concluded in Russia's favour under the reign of Tsar Nicholas I, and I believe that was in the year 1829. So this really is um, a nearly 200-year struggle. What is more remarkable is the transformation of Russia again vis-a-vis -vis the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland and again, Poland had been an on and off conflict with Sweden for this entire sort of period we're discussing for the past 50 years. And yet Sweden had now redirected its efforts towards the Holy Roman Empire. And of course, that was the subject for um, last week's lecture and discussion, the, the intervention of Gustavus Adolphus, the, the victory at Breitenfeld and his uh, death at Lutzen. At a time where Poland, again, should have been potentially secure, um, John II Casimir, the half-brother of Vladislav IV, was elected while a great Cossack revolt was underway in Ukraine. In contrast to Russia, the nobles of Poland took the death of Vladislaw and the dubious legitimacy of John II to increase their power. With Polish power considerably weakened, Alexis invaded Poland in 1654 with the blessing of the Patriarch to regain not only Russia's lost territory, but the entire ancient patrimony of Kiev to bolster the Tsar's legitimacy as the Tsar of all the Russias. And of course, looking back at this territory, um, we mentioned in previous lectures how Ukraine, essentially, Ukraine, you know, now means the borderlands, but Ukraine, um, during the time of Vladimir the Great, had been the, you know, the cultural heartlands of the of the Rus civilization, which, after the Golden Horde, had reorientated north towards Moscow. So this was the first time, really, that we see a considerably weakened uh, Lithuanian Grand Duchy, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, allowing for the Tsar to potentially reacquire and establish his, you know, hegemony over all of these territories and, you know, truly be the, the Tsar of all the Russias. After a, um, a rather brilliant uh, year, single year's campaign, a very decisive campaign, uh, Smolensk was taken, the, the key fortress essentially on the approach to Moscow. And essentially all of the left bank of the Ukraine and by left bank Ukraine, of course, the, the main river running through not just Belarus, but also through um, uh, Ukraine's river Dnieper, uh, one of the key arteries of, um, of the Kievan Rus. Uh, the left bank of it was essentially ceded to Russia and with it, Russia gained responsibility over the new Kes uh, Cossack um, Hetmanate, which had been established by the, uh, the rebellion against the Polish. A year later, in 1655, the Swedish invaded Poland so successfully that they occupied and devastated most of the state in an infamous episode of Polish history known as the Swedish Deluge. Alexis then invaded and conquered much of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, seen in this map here. Rather than come to an agreement with Sweden, Alexis declared war on them, hoping to undo Russia's defeat in the Volian Wars and acquire Riga in the Baltic. This was arguably the biggest tactical blunder of Alexis's reign, as the Swedish-Russian war gave the Polish the time to counterattack. So at this point, it was very possible for the Russians to potentially parcel off and partition the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth between them. Uh, but of course, th this is actually mainly the result of um, the urgings of uh, Ferdinand III, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was very concerned that the major Catholic power in um, Eastern Europe had suddenly gone and that uh, you see, you know, a Polish, um, a Poland under control of Sweden uh, potentially meant a Protestant, a Protestant Poland. Uh, so rather than deal with that, uh, Habsburg policy was very much um, directed towards breaking down this potential alliance uh, between the Russians and the Swedish, which would have come at the expense 
of the major Catholic power in the region. Uh, so in this case, it was a masterstroke uh, by the Habsburgs uh, to contrive this uh, hostility uh, between the Russians and the Swedes. Um, and of course, it backfires you know, tremendously for both parties. Uh, because it gives the Polish, you know, that crucial time to counterattack and reconsolidate. And indeed, you know, this could have led to a, um, a period of the, you know, partitions of Poland uh, some 100 years uh, before we see the actual partitions of Poland in the latter half of the 18th century. By 1661, peace with Sweden was made, in which again, Russia gained nothing. An enduring peace with Poland was achieved with the uh, truce of um, uh, Andrusovo, by which the Russians gained Kiev, they relinquished most of their ambitions, such as that to the entire Lithuanian portion of the Commonwealth. Under the Tsar's new chancellor, um, Matveyev, uh, Alexis pursued a peaceful policy for the remainder of his reign. Now, if you indulge me, we'll get to the one of the most complicated yet interesting um, uh, parts of this moment of Russian history, because, of course, a tangent has been linking this through to um, uh, the idea of the Third Rome, uh, the religious reforms, uh, Macarius, and finally coming to uh, to Nikon, and of course the elevation of uh, Moscow from a, uh, a metropolitan sea to a patriarchal sea uh, on the level of the of the great um, orthodox sort of ecumenical seas of uh, uh, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and of course um, Rome, but of course the idea that Rome was Eastern Orthodox at this point is utterly ridiculous. So again, just completing this note, I mean, we see the um, reforms begin with the uh, the Stoglav of uh, 1551 under Macarius, uh, the elevation of the Patriarchate under uh, under Theodore, uh, the expansion of this institution under co-sovereign Philaret, and now we finally arrive at the Russian Reformation, uh, led by the Tsar's favourite Patriarch, um, Nikon, and the Zealots of Piety, many of whom rose to prominence after the seminary reforms of Philaret. The members of this organisation believed that the time of troubles was caused by God's wrath, aimed at the perversions of Russian orthodoxy. In order for Russia to be secure and to prevent another time of troubles, the Russian orthodox faith needed to be purged and for there to be a renewable piety among the Russian masses. In particular, uh, the emphasis was on particular deviations from the Greek uh, Orthodox Church. The most famous example of this was the sign of the cross given in two fingers as opposed to three. Um, the old Russia or the old believer way of um, uh, making the sign of the cross um, is with two fingers. And uh, again, we have the, uh, the sister of uh, Boris uh, uh, Mozarov, who was um, uh, one of the sort of most high profile of the old believers. Here she's being um, uh, carted away um, in, a, in a famous painting uh, by Surikov, um, again, showing how much this uh, loomed in the imaginations of, um, of the 19th century Russians who were very much going through this, this period of orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality. So this would have been during the reign of Alexander III. Um, in defiance of her incarceration, she is holding up two fingers to indicate her adherence again to the old believers, the, the old way of um, making the sign of the cross. And I have here a... Um, a fantastic article. It's quite old, so um, there are going to be a lot of references to Soviet as opposed to uh, uh, to Russian uh, historiography. And nevertheless, it's by uh, uh, Michael uh, Jeniavsky, and I've, I've got the link in the description. Um, uh, it gets to the crux of the issue and um, much of the, the paradox that, that this represents in terms of structuring a, a continuous sort of path or narrative when it comes to church reform in Russian history. Um, it, it nevertheless, it's quite a long article, so I've only had to take you know certain segments of it just to. Um, uh, explain you know, why this is why this um, is significant. For nearly two hundred years of the history of the Raskol, and again the Raskol, uh, the schismatics, or you know the, the splitters, uh, the Russian Church schism of the seventeenth century was a secret one. To be sure, the old believers wrote in enormous quantities, but they wrote by hand, secret manuscripts, copied secretly, and circulated secretly. And except for official condemnations of schismatic teachings and the publication of laws directed against the Raskolniki, again, the, the schismatics or the, uh, uh, the people who are schismatic, more or less serious historical investigation started only in the last year of the reign of Emperor Nicholas I and was confined to printed but highly restricted memoranda passed around in the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Even the nature and the chronology of the early Raskol historiography raised questions about the nature of the schism. Why was the history of the rascal secret for such a long time? Why were the old believers persecuted by the government for so long? Was it all as the government maintained because they were ignorant, illiterate, superstitious, fanatical, and disobedient toward the church? 
With the death of Nicholas, the persecution of the old believers slackened, and the historiography of the schism emerged into the open. In the last century, an enormous amount has been published on the rascal, it meaning the early history and development, and in most of the work, the motivation and presuppositions are unequivocal. First, there is the official orthodox position, represented largely by professors of the various imperial and theological academies. The historians of this school did excellent work in publishing the source material. Their explanation of the schism and the schismatics was simple. The rejection of the Nikonian church, and again, this is um, Arch, uh, Patriarch Nikon, a reform in the 17th century, was a reflection of popular and clerical ignorance and obscurantism, the mistaking of ritual for substance. Rejecting all progress and change, the schismatics have rejected and continue to reject legitimate authority of the church hierarchy on which their souls depended, and of the state as well inasmuch as it supported the official church, sinking ever deeper into fanaticism of either total and irreverent individualism and sectarianism, or of hopeless internal theological and ritualistic contradictions. The old believers were impelled by a superstitious religiosity, though their, this basic motivation carried political overtones to the extent that the last called Nikki disobeyed the authorities who tried to rescue them from perdition. There is little one need say about these 19th century Orthodox professors. They were convinced that the old believers were heretics at best, schismatics for rejecting the authority and legitimacy of the church hierarchy. They published a great deal of source material and we should not expect anything else. Simultaneously with the Orthodox view emerged a liberal populist position led by Shapopov, a whole group of historians suggested a more comprehensive explanation of the schism which produced the old believers. The rascal, as they saw it, was only superficially a religious split. Religious issues provided the opportunity for the expression of social and political protest against the ever-increasing importations from the West, clothes, customs, institutions, political against the central fact of the 17th century Russian history, the legalization in 1649 of the complete ensurfment of the peasants. These historians observed after the first few years, the schismatics were exclusively of lower class origin, peasants and some of the poorer townspeople, but that rather than being ignorant and dark and a dark element of Russia, they contained and continue to contain a much higher percentage of literate people than the Orthodox population. Hence the old believers represent a general popular opinion and its desire to preserve, if nothing more, popular customs and in institutions against the encroachment of the centralizing and bureaucratic state. The conception of the rascal as a social protest is shared, of course, by Soviet historians, though initially few interested themselves in this problem. But in the last 15 years, under the impetus of the enthusiasm and erudition of V.I. Malyshev, all believer studies has acquired a new prominence. The chief concerns of Soviet scholars have been within the social structure and ideology of the old believers, and with the writings of the old believer church fathers, Avakum, Efani, Lazo, Fyodor, and secular literature. Within this historic, uh, historiographic uh, context, recent American scholarship sounds a curious note. No special work on the schism as such has been written, but all the recent or recently revised general histories of Russia, of course, mention the rascal, presenting it as an expression of Muscovite traditionalism, attention to form rather than substance, ignorance, inertia, the antithesis to the Western Reformation and its search for change. What does it mean to speak of the Russian masses in the 17th century as tradition bound, compared with whom? Traditions are not immutable at each age as its own. In the West, as well as in the East, all Christian reform movements offered a return to the past, whatever the real mo motives of those movements may have been. The problem always has been which of the many paths to defend, which is the more intelligent to use three fingers in the crossing oneself rather than two. Despite patronizing references to strange practices of the old believers, all religious practices, or perhaps none, have scholarly foundation. In matters of ritual and theology, a source can always be found to support one's position, and the old believers could, could and did point to many various ancient icons showing the two-fingered sign of the cross. True, as Ferensky has stated, there seems to have been little principle or dogma involved, but the issue of a double or triple hallelujah is equal in importance to the filioque cause and the leavened unleavened bread controversies which supposedly had divided the Roman and Greek churches until today. These categories then, traditionalism, the preferred correct form, even national self-awareness, are abstractions from which explain nothing and which in turn create other abstractions, the reformation, orthodoxy, scholarly foundations of ritual. From these contributions of populists and uh, Soviet scholars, we can derive four general observations without going into the details of the arguments. A very significant number of Russians embraced the schism. From the start, probably as many as 20% were old believers. 
The RAS call was most widespread in the areas where the central government was less effective than elsewhere for a variety of reasons, lack of serfdom, distance, political considerations, as northern Russia, the Urals, Siberia, Cossack lands, and a large section of the Western frontier were overwhelmingly schismatic. All believers were severely and often brutally persecuted from the beginning of the schism until the middle of the 19th century. And the rascal began in the century of profound social upheaval and tension. It is hard to find a decade of the 17th century which is not masked by rebellions of unrest of peasants or Cossacks, townspeople or Streltsy. And the Streltsy will play a, a very prominent role in our conversation on the Pitrine period, uh, but I'll save an analysis of the Streltsy for that conversation. Parallel, paralleling these, the triumph of the gentry service after the time of the troubles, the law code of 1649, which legalized serfdom, the state church controversy of Tsar Alexis and Patriarch Nikon, and the beginning of the Petrine reforms, again, the reforms of Peter the Great. In other words, the rascal assumed huge dimensions. It was most prevalent where government authority could be most easily res resisted or disregarded. It was considered a serious and major problem by the government and there were more than enough concrete political and social reasons to account for origins and spread. This is not to argue that other factions um, in the schism, cultural tradition, theology, ritual did not exist. Like all heterodox or schismatic movements, the Razkol developed and expressed its ideology in the language of religion. This language is not ours today and hence offers difficulties of interpretation. The issue is not that of the old believers or the Russians or medieval man in general, necessarily thought in a manner so different from ours about politics, economics and social problems, or their life in general, but they used a particular and comprehensive vocabulary to express their thoughts. And this theological or religious language, like all language, possessed a logic of its own, and indeed in the way of their history of old believers, like the Protestants in the West, could be forced rather radical theological views, because theological terms, no matter what, uh, why used, evoke theological consequences. Still, this language can be analysed, its origin suggested, and its meaning understood in its proper context. This is a fascinating point, actually, regarding the, the inaccessibility of um, the early modern and medieval mindset as a result of the, uh, the theological constructions underpinning their, their mode of thought. And of course, uh, for historians of interacting this period, this very much continues until the, um, the late 18th century, and in some places it continues even beyond that. In my case, um, being a Catholic, it's easier for me to to understand and enter that mindset because, you know, in terms of the the basic theology, uh, there is a continuity which exists, which um, doesn't represent the stark break again between um, being religious and being secular. You know, um, believing in God and being an atheist. Um, so in, in this case, for me, it's much easier to access that mindset and to to empathise and sympathise with those people as you know. The, the, the crux of being essentially, I would like to think, a good historian is to enter sympathetically into the modes of thought um, with which, again, the, the people of that time, you know, were thinking, express, and how this informs the course of human action and forms the course of history. But of course, if you are secular, worse than that, if you are um, secular and have a particular agenda, um, you have to sort of overcome these obstacles. And in some cases, there is sadly no attempt to overcome these obstacles. And um, there is this horrible reductionism of these people to superstitious ignorant and look at ourselves look, 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 look at us moderns aren't we so much more um, wonderful and enlightened uh, than those uh, superstitious folk of the past uh, which is most unfortunate who are actually trying to understand the uh, the process and the intelligence of these peoples and what their ultimate motivations were the old believers wrote about many things details of ritual dogma way of life but at all times one of their chief concerns was with authority government or symbolically the czar for in the final analysis it was the czar wielding absolute power over both uh, over both um, state and church who cut them off from the rest of society approved their being excommunicated and even anathematized and again excommunication is a less severe form of um, anathematization to be anathematized means that um your thoughts your personage is completely cut off uh not just from the religious body but as a consequence you're essentially ostracized from society and essentially it's considered you know the closest thing to an earthly writ of um of uh, eternal damnation and condemnation uh to be anathematized forced them to be so different distinct from others and persecuted them with such violence this strand of old believers thought regarding the state and the czar, but expressed in theological terms, what may, one may call the political theology of the rascal is our theme. Our first concern then is with the language in which the concrete social and political problems involving imperial power were couched. Where did the old believers find the terms they used? What was the logic of their thought? What were the consequences of the sort? 
and by whom was it understood? The obvious starting point is the religious reforms in the middle of the 17th century, which provoked the schism, but without losing sight of the fact that correction of texts and changes in ritual began in Russia even before Nikon became patriarch in 1652. In the 14th century, uh, when the Heskas influence uh, transmitted the uh, Neoplatonic concern with words and meanings, Russia was probably flooded by corrected texts from South Slavic lands. In the 15th century, Grand Prince Ivan III, the first titular Tsar, it should be noted, and a metropolitan of Russia, Gjolonti, clashed violently on points of ritual. And in 1551, Ivan IV Grozny, the Terrible, called together the so-called Stoklav Council to legislate reforms of morals and rituals. Finally, as Kapaterev uh, showed some 70 years ago, a systemic approach to correct uh, liturgical text began, uh, probably under Patriarch Filaret in the 1620s, and at last under the Patriarch Yosef in the 1640s. Consequently, Nikon and the higher clergy in general were the executors of reforms initiated and guided by the Tsar, that is the secular government. And of course, in this case, when we come to the reign of Tsar Michael, it should be remembered that the, uh, uh, the Patriarchate and the Tsar were basically one and the same, at least for the, uh, the period from 1619 until 1633. The reform movement, in fact, was by no means monolithic, and one can distinguish three strands of reform through uh, th uh, th through thought and action. Uh, they were what one may purely call administrative reforms, legislation affected by the state, culminating in the article of the Code of Law, uh, which established the uh, Department of Monasteries, and which in effect abolished separate ecclesiastical jurisdiction and much of ecclesiastical economic power. This is the, the major taxation of the monasteries. This strand necessarily overlapped with the administrative intellectual reform correlation of amendment of text and ritual out of desire for accuracy and uniformity. This reform can be identified with Greek and South Russian scholars, subsidized and supported by Tsar Alexis and by his chamberlain, uh, the Boya uh, F. Lichev, who paid for much of the research and founded the School of Theological and Linguistic Studies. Then there were the Zealots of Piety, who I've already mentioned, a group of priests under the leadership of the archpriest uh, Stepan uh, uh, Vonifatiev, confessor to Tsar Alexis. The concern of these priests was the moral spiritual reform. This does not mean that they were involved with the administration of intellectual reforms, as is the case with the, um, the famous uh, Idina Glassi, but their main efforts were directed towards improvement of public morality, towards a religious revival, their chief vehicle was one which was dormant in Russian ecclesiastical practice, was the public sermon. In fact, the clerics of this group owed much of their power and influence to their effectiveness as preachers in the various churches of Moscow. The members of this group were in effect the founding fathers of the Raskol, reformers who were closely associated with Nikon before he became patriarch, but who opposed his later reforms to the point of schism. Hence, even on purely religious, on a religious plane, it is not possible to contrast reform and tradition all the parties involved, ecclesiastical delay, were for reform of some kind or another. In the first two years of his patriarchate, 1652 to 54, Nikon decreed changes in the ritual, the sign of the cross, the number and manner of, pros uh, of prostrations, the Hallelujah glorification, and the published new and published new service books. He was opposed by the majority of the white clergy and many of the prelates. In a series of councils between 1654 and 1656, Nikon forced through the acceptance of his reforms and condemned by his priestly opponents um, and condemned his priestly opponents who would not submit. By 1656, those who were apparently very few in number, a small group of the Moscow preachers, led by Archpriest of Akum. They were severely punished and exiled in the line of hierarchical discipline. I should I'll just make my own sort of notes here. So it should be noted that the reforms had the effect of alienating members of the zealots of piety, who now believed that Nikon was simply expanding and centralising the power of the patriarchate. When Nikon protested the new Russian legal code that placed taxes on the monasteries, Nikon alienated his erstwhile defender of the Tsar. Nikon's interpretation, again, this, this idea of symphonia, uh, all the way, again, we're, we're talking about the, um, the influence of the, the 8th century and the 9th century Byzantium in this period. Well, this is also the period of Symphonia established with the beginning of the Macedonian dynasty and um, Basil I, the idea of the, uh, the ecclesiastical and um, temporal functions of the patriarch and the Tsar. Nikon's own interpret interpretation of Symphonia was that the Tsar and the patriarch ruled over temporal and ecclesiastical realms respectively and separately. Believing he was indispensable for church reform, and unwilling to subordinate the patriarchate, he went into self-imposed exile in 1658, and very dramatically um, abandoning his uh, his golden patriarchal robes. And um, this leads to again the situation where the the patriarchal see is technically 
controlled by Nikon, uh, but he is unwilling to discharge his duties. Unable to resolve the crisis and division within the Russian Synod, uh, the Patriarch's seat was effectively vacant now for eight years. It wasn't until the Great Moscow Synod of 1667, with the attendance of the Patriarchs of Alexandria and Antioch, that Nikon was finally deposed on grounds of his brutality to his underlings and his uncanonical remo un uh, canonical removal of the dissident Bishop Paul of Kolomna, who was one of the, uh, uh, the chief supporters of the Old Believers. Nikon was then exiled to a monastery, though he managed to outlive Alexis. The Great Synod didn't prevent the schism, rather it guaranteed it. Macarius and his great Stoklav, or councillor, 1551, were deemed heretical for dogmatizing Russian church rituals at various with Greek ones. Prominent old believers, such as Avakum, were brought to the Synod to recant, only to be defrocked, anathematized, and ultimately executed in 1682. Old believers, meant, uh, old believers migrated to Siberia and the Lower Volga, where they put, took part in the Stepan Lazin Rebellion. This movement continued as an illegal sect all the way up until 1905, when we have the 1905 revolution. Now here, um, uh, who's the author of this, so I can remember, uh, Cheniavsky uh, brings in a, a fascinating um, uh, course about the implications of this, because of course, this isn't um, a straight link. I mean, just to summarize my own sort of uh, thoughts when uh, reviewing this topic, it is very much as if we have this uh, increasing, you know, the, the power of the patriarchal, patriarchal sort of state and the, the power of the Tsar almost go hand in hand, as was the case with Macarius. And Macarius was not only empowering the Tsar, he was empowering the Russian Orthodox Church. Paradoxically, uh, we are also seeing uh, here the same sort of undercurrent. We are seeing uh, Nikon uh, wanting to reform and empower the, uh, uh, the Patriarch and again, support the reform program, which is very much sponsored uh, by the second Roman of Tsar Alexis. However, uh, rather than, uh, you know, increasing this tendency towards, you could say, a separate Russian church from the Greek one, uh, which had, you know, just been anathematized, the, uh, the Stoglov Council of 1551, uh, we are seeing the opposite trend. Uh, we are seeing, you know, an attempt to synchronize the, the Russian Orthodox Church with the reforms in the Greek church um, and to purge um, elements of, um, uh, of Russian ritual that were seen as, again, anathema uh, compared to the standard practices of the of the Russian Orthodox Church and of course this ends uh, not with the you know the expansion of the powers of the patriarchate as we saw during the uh, the co-reign the diarchy of Michael and Philaret uh, but now we're seeing the Tsar um, having an overriding authority over the patriarch and again placing the the monasteries under their own respected department where they can be taxed and where they can um, <laughs> fund the autocracy. Uh, so just getting onto this and um, the implications for Russian nationalism and the, the third Rome paradox posed by the Raskov. Given the nature of the necessary justification of religious changes, this issue of legislation resulted not only in a reaffirmation of the ideal Christian past, but also in a condemnation of the Russian historical past. The fathers of the Raskov accepted the challenge with eagerness Time and again, they pose the confrontation. If one is to impute heresy, one must make one's choices either for the Russian past, the saints, and the Holy Council, presided over by the pious Orthodox Tsar Ivan IV, or for the despotic patriarch Nikon. And thus they evoke the obscure doctrine of Moscow, the Third Rome, meaning to them that in the process of translatio imperii, Moscow was the spiritual capital of Christianity, that her unique and exclusive orthodoxy was historically proven and divinely confirmed. And as the Third Rome was also the last, and again, this is linking back to um, connection uh, with my, uh, my, my previous stream, which very much went over this idea of uh, the Third Rome and orthodoxy, orthodoxy and nationality. Um, uh, and as the Third Rome was also the last, this meant that Muscovite orthodoxy uh, was the only currency of the economy of salvation. If Moscow were to fall from grace, betray the faith, as had the first two Romes, it would mean not only the fall of Moscow as a state, as divine punishment, but the end of the whole world. A fourth Rome there could not be, and Moscow's fall would signify the end of the possibility of salvation for all men, and the coming of the last days. Before the uh, both the utility and danger of this doctrine was obvious. On the one hand, it allowed the old believers to dismiss the authority of the Eastern patriarchs, representatives of the second and fallen Rome. On the other hand, this issue was imbued with enormous tension and urgency. One could not afford a mistake, even a temporary one, for the stakes were ultimate and the penalty irreversible. 
The framework of Moscow, the Third Rome, of the confrontation of Ivan the Terrible with Nikon, made the argument a historical one over the meaning of the Russian past and the significance of the Russian present. The historical focus allowed and encouraged the expression of prejudices, dislike for the Greeks, coming for arms, for the learned Ukrainian corrupted by Latinity, and for the presence of Western foreigners of all sorts in Moscow, with their heretical religions and strange customs. All these stirred noisy argument on Russia and its religion. And of course, when he's referring to the, the Latinate um, Ukrainians, these are the Polonized uh, Ruthenians uh, who have been brought into the, uh, the Greek rite in the, the Unitate Church within um, uh, within the kept within the, the communion with the Pope essentially uh, where there are many sort of orthodox um, uh, liturgical things are preserved but they are part of the Catholic Church and this was the case essentially of uh, allowing for the um, uh, the very much sort of eagerly Catholic um, uh, Sigismund the third Vasa uh, to convert the vast number of um, orthodox subjects he found in the Ukraine. But within the religious controversy, there seems to have been very little religion. For the Nikonians, the issue was one of authority, of discipline, of the right to legislate, and how little the substance of the reforms matters to the arrogant and obstinate patriarch can be seen from his lack of interest in them after his first abdication in 1658. If Nikon was inconstant and the anti-Nikonians were, incons were inconsistent, for them too, the issue seems to have been authority, the right of legislation, and the Third Rome Doctrine, made the peculiarly uh, peculiarly vulnerable uh, made this peculiarly peculiarly vulnerable in this respect uh, for what they deny to Nikon and Tsar Alexis the right to legislate on ritual they gladly granted to Metropolitan Macarius Tsar Ivan the fourth and the council of 1551 the problem does not end here however for it is clear that the Nikonians too accepted the doctrine of the third Rome Nikon used the authority of the Greeks as long as he found it useful but after 1658, his denunciation of their corruption and heresy more than matched that of Avakum, again, the founding father of the old believers. True, the Greeks became Nikon's political enemies in a struggle with Tsar Alexis, but to express his enmity, he used a third Rome, anti-Greek vocabulary, which was apparently becoming commonplace. And Alexis's view of the Greeks, and hence later of Russian orthodoxy, was best shown at the Council of 1666 uh, to 67. Uh, there the Tsar learned, as did everyone else, that the patriarchs who condemned Nikon confirmed Nikon's reforms and anathematized the old believers, uh, were both uh, Makarios of Antioch and Pesos of Alexandria, uh, deposed and no longer patriarchs. Although the Tsar spent much effort to have them restored to their sees and his contempt for the Greeks and even for the Russian prelate, he did not see fit to question the decisions of a council conducted under such dubious chairmanship. The issue, therefore, was not whether one had rejected or accepted Moscow as the Third Rome, but what the Third Rome meant. Nikon and Alexis could afford to drop the Greek patriarchs or anything else, precisely because Moscow was the Third Rome. For then, anything that the Tsar and the patriarch of the Third Rome did was by definition orthodox and legitimate. Right. Because, essentially, because Moscow was orthodoxy, Nothing might be changed, but the theology was political in its implications. This is best illustrated by the fact that both the Nikonians and Avakumians, the final and supreme authority in matters of faith or ritual of the church, was the Tsar. At the centre of the Third Rome doctrine, and at the centre of the Russian 17th century political theory, stood the theocratic Russian Tsar. In the eyes of the monk Philo Fay, who first formulated the Third Rome ideology, it was the Russian ruler who preserved orthodoxy in Russia and hence in the whole world, and the burden of the Third Rome of keeping faith rested on his shoulders. A soldier, a shoulder, <laughs> shoulders. The 17th century, the reign of Alexis in particular, was the apogee of the theocratic idea. Elected by God, crowned by God, most pious and orthodox, the most gentle Tsar ruled Russia as an autocrat, but his life was conducted down to the smallest detail to correspond to the religious ideal. Certainly Alexis lived up to the ceremonial ideal as successfully as Ivan the Terrible, the pious Tsar of the Sokolov Council. The controversy thus becomes still more puzzling. Why and how resist the most gentle Tsar? How deny him the right to do what is pious, saintly, and his predecessors had done legitimately? So in that summary, that, that rather sort of succinct summary, we saw all of the implications in terms of the Tsar directing reform, in terms of the implications of that for Russian nationalism. This idea that uh, the Raskol is indeed representing an element of Russian tradition, hearkening back 
uh, to Ivan the Terrible, which is now being directly contradicted uh, by the reforms of uh, the most gentle Tsar, uh, the second Romanov Tsar, Alexis. And of course, the reason I set this up, this idea of nationalism and tradition, and the Tsar is the instigator of reform, is that this um, sets us up very nicely for when we discuss the Petrine reforms, the the uh, Peter the Great, and how, you know, considering his you know, significant reforms, including the abolition of the patriarchate itself, um, how can this square again with this conception of the Third Rome and the idea of Russia again as orthodoxy, and Russia not only as orthodoxy, but as the Third Rome holding on its shoulders the weight of eternal salvation, as you know the Russians very much saw themselves at this time. And again, when Alexis was conducting this reform, there was this, um, uh, this again, fear, the the time of troubles hadn't entirely faded away um, from Russian history at this point. So baked into this was the very um, <laughs> earthly consideration of a religious reform strengthening the Russian state, strengthening the Third Rome um, against not only um, you know the, the the threats more without, but the threats more within, who could potentially um, lead to a, a second demise of the of of the Russian dynasty of the Russian royal family and result in a new period of anarchy. And again, potentially with it, the the massive sort of political and um, religious implications of that. I think because of this, it's rather, rather obvious as to why Tsar Alexis uh, was treated very favorably uh, by the 19th century um, uh, Russians, uh, Russian historiography uh, for his religious reform and for, again, being considered the, the quietest and the most peaceful. Uh, he was the Tsar who was most emulated uh, by the later Romanovs after the anti-Westernizer turn of um, Nicholas I. Um, and again, he was actively promoted during the reign of um, Nicholas II, uh, not just um, superficially in terms of the uh, the iconography of the reign of Nicholas II, but in terms of the naming convention of his son, the Tsarevich Alexis. And in terms of the Tsar wanting to imitate the uh, the temper of religious reform and referring to himself essentially as the quietest Tsar. And of course, Tsar Nicholas II's uh, father, Alexander III, uh, was also known as the Tsar Peacemaker. So the legacy of Alexis therefore looms very large over the uh, over the influence of especially the, the later Romanovs. Uh, but here we also see the seeds concerning the future of the of, of Russia, namely uh, interaction, the, the various sort of foreign influences. In particular, we mentioned the arrival of the Lutheran churches under Boris Godunov, uh, foreign officers uh, support, uh, supporting and training the Russian army and the implications this will have for westernization. It wasn't just um, a case that Russia was isolated and then Russia suddenly burst onto the political scene uh, with uh, Peter the Great's uh, founding of his window on the West. Uh, this was a process that really had begun uh, with Ivan the Fourth, and perhaps even earlier uh, with his link to the English. And this is a process which is happening under the radar, um, but nevertheless is politically and military seismic uh, throughout the 17th century. And of course, a direct link uh, between this conversation and uh, my future uh, lecture and discussion on Peter the Great is this awkward dynastic situation, which I haven't mentioned uh, concerning Alexis. Alexis was married twice, uh, first to uh, Maria uh, Miloslavskaya as part of the uh, the Boris uh, uh, Mozarov uh, uh, conspiracy. And with her, he had 13 children. However, afterwards, um, he married a second time. Uh, he married uh, Natalia uh, uh, Nalishkina, uh, with whom he had three children, including the later Peter the Great. Now, Peter the Great was definitely not meant uh, to inherit. The, uh, the Tsar had five sons um, in seniority before um, uh, Peter the Great. Um, and the Tsar, you know, with uh, the, the person who actually succeeded uh, Alexis to become Tsar in what year? 1676. Uh, was Theodore the Third, who was noted as a um, not only as a, a capable czar but a westernizing czar, and um, unfortunately he falls prey at the age of twenty-one uh, to this uh, rare hereditary form of early Romanov scurvy, which I alluded to with um, with uh, Michael the First. It's interesting how history again may have taken a different turn had uh, Theodore the Third survived. So in the event, um, we now have the uh, mentally enfeebled uh, czar Ivan. Ivan V, and essentially a cataclysmic struggle between these uh, these two families of the of now the now late Tsar Alexis, um, the the family of uh, uh, Miloslavskaya and uh, the Nadishkina, 
um, which will lead to the unprecedented situation throughout the 1680s, uh, where there are two czars simultaneously and a great sovereign, this being um, uh, the great sovereign of Gospida, um, Sophia. So, uh, and, and again, we, we talked about this, the implications of the old believers having for Russian nationalism and this idea that we're importing foreign reforms, Catholic reforms uh, through the Ukraine and uh, Greek reforms uh, through the ecumenical patriarchal sea um, against this, you know, idea of Russian nationalism and uh, Russian exceptionalism. Uh, we're really going to see that uh, put to the test when we um, embark upon this uh, conversation about the Petrine reform. So hopefully you can um, uh, forgive me for my, my indulgence on the, uh, on the Russian Reformation, which I'm sure many of you may have never heard of. So um, it's interesting to, uh, to bring this conversation to light. It's only unfortunate that because we're not having a discussion portion to this discussion, uh, sorry, discussion portion to this uh, episode, that um, I really can't sort of go into this in um, in more depth. But I think looking at the effects of uh, 1610 to 1613, the battle for Moscow, the Polish occupation, uh, this is really a, another baptism of fire uh, when it comes to uh, not only Russian nationalism, uh, but the autocracy itself. Because as we saw in our previous conversation, Ivan IV had established uh, autocracy through terror and he had done it in a state of war. Um, the Romanovs here managed to rescue a incredibly precarious situation where it looked as if not only um, the Russian political system, but Russia itself uh, would fall under foreign influence and uh, possibly change its religion. Uh, thanks to the Romanovs and uh, mainly the influence of uh, Filaret and uh, Alexis and his advisors, um, Russia has again emerged as um, a major power in the region and an orthodox power under an autocratic czar, which looked almost impossible if you're looking at this through the events of, um, of 1610, etc. Um, and again, the other interesting topic to note is uh, Russian power vis-a-vis -vis the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, throughout the later part of the Livonian Wars during the reign of Ivan IV, and um, of course the time of troubles, Poland was very much the superior power uh, compared to Russia. Um, but then of course we see the dramatic uh, change of fate uh, with the Cossack revolt in 1648. So coming off right after the Thirty Years' War, uh, we see the political and you know economic military collapse of Poland brought around by the, the Russian invasion and the Swedish deluge. Uh, so much so that um, you know the period between you know, 1650 to 1667 uh, uh, is really sort of the dark age of um, of Polish history. Poland is able to hold on to its territories. It's able to undergo a uh, a moderate restoration. Uh, but Polish power in Europe is never going to be what it was under, say, for example, its height under Sigismund the Third Vasa. Um, so again, you know, Russia and even Sweden for, for a brief amount of time, and the Habsburg monarchy and Prussia are going to gain in power, and Poland is going to diminish progressively over the next um, century. And of course, another point to mention is that um, it looked almost as if from the false Dmitry uh, through to Vladislaw of Poland, that Russia could have been converted to Catholicism. Uh, by the end of the partitions, uh, Poland has all been occupied, all but been occupied by a orthodox and Polish power. So we're seeing the a major religious reversal when it comes to the powers of the of the of the Catholics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Orthodox and the Protestants. So yes, I mean, other than the implications, what I hope you can draw about the implications of this being an ideological struggle and a nationalist struggle and a struggle over the Russian political system, uh, you can draw, I think, quite a, quite a lot of uh, comparisons in terms of the, the situation facing uh, uh, Russia um, over even the same territories over Ukraine today. Um, but yes, that, that is very much the end of my uh, uh, my extended lecture. I've, I've tried to make it a little longer to compensate for the fact uh, that there is going to be um, uh, no discussion portion, but hopefully um, uh, you enjoyed it. Now I can indulge you by answering your various questions. Um, so I, I'll just quickly go to the Super Chats first, and then I'll go over uh, the comments. And um, it'll probably be easier for me if you can send your questions now. Uh, even better if you could do at academic um at, at apostolic majesty uh so i can actually see the comments um but i'll, I'll go to the um go to the super chats first so nick s for five uh, us dollars uh what is your take am on the historic border uh 
uh, between Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, does that have bearings on the nonsense going on today? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, I'll, I'll get the map up because I think this actually illustrates my point rather well. Okay, here. Um, taking away the pink area is roughly the border between Russia and Poland uh, throughout the latter half of the 17th century and the early part of the 18th century, really up until the first partition of Poland, which was in 1772, um, if I remember. And um, as you can see, um, this more or less directly, into, I'm not sure how, how cognizant most of you are of geography, um, in terms of um, your, your cognizance of you know, where the modern borders are. But essentially, if you attribute the pink area to Russia, well, which you know, it became part of Russia after uh, the deluge, um, this is roughly half of Ukraine uh, belonging to Russia and half of Ukraine uh, belonging to Poland and, of course, being Catholic. Um, so in terms of my take on the, uh, on the historic border, um, it is pretty obvious that the, the the right bank of the the right bank of the Dnieper is far more not just um, orientated towards Russia and its culture, uh, but ethnically because of course after this period we see uh, uh, the campaigns of uh, uh, Potemkin during the reign of Catherine the Great and the establishment of the so-called Potemkin villages and the creation of Novorossiya. And after the uh, forced um, uh, deportations of the Cossacks from Crimea. Uh, during the, uh, the the dominion of Stalin, so to speak, uh, that re region became very uh, Russianized. Hence, you know why the Russians were able to uh, take it back in uh, in uh, 2014 with so much ease. Uh, so yes, I think um, that is the issue really with uh, Ukrainian nationalism. You have half the country which is ethnically and culturally orientated towards Russia, the demarcation point being the Dnieper, with the capital city of Kiev right in the center of it, and the western half being far more associated with um, uh, Catholic Poland. And this was a situation which continued uh, because this area, most of this area in the west you see, uh, was part of Galicia Lodomeria, uh, which was then part of um, Austria, later Austria-Hungary, and um, would only be briefly occupied by the Russians during the uh, during 1915, um, but then wouldn't become part of the Soviet Union until after the Second World War. So this idea of all of Ukraine, the territory of Ukraine uh, being you know part of Russia or, you know, the other way around, all of Ukraine being separate from Russia is really a thing we only see after um, the Second World War. Uh, to try and sort of explain the uh, the intricacies of the border situation with um uh, with uh, Ukraine and Russia, and as to why there are you know major implications of where you put it essentially uh, due to the uh, the fractured nature of um, uh, Ukrainian nationalism. A lady of Shalot for four pounds forty nine uh, in eighteen sixty one. Um, Alexander II referred to Alexei's serf code, autocracy established serfdom, and it's up to autocracy to abolish it. Any thoughts on this? Yes, I think that's um, that's very accurate. Um, I remember mentioning on a uh, on another stream, uh, not on this channel, I think, that what we see the remarkable situation with serfdom in Russia is that under the you know early period of Russian history, the Kievan Rus, um, the Golden Horde, um, Russian serfs were relatively free, especially compared to uh, their counterparts in Western Europe. The, the idea of a Russian serf didn't really exist, uh, partly because um, the Russian states were so vast and um, it was almost impossible to track peasant movements. So there was a lot of movement around just this vast landscape. And of course, um, what we see paradoxically is with the decline of feudalism, the decline of an independent nobility, we see the increase in serfdom. And as we see, there is a political impetus which actually cements autocracy, which is that autocracy is guaranteeing your right to have serfs. So you need to essentially surrender your political rights as nobles in order to achieve this, um, uh, your, your land and wealth as a result of the serfs. So yes, uh, and also if you look at the progression of serfdom in Russia, uh, the first sort of intensification of it we see is with the Oflichnini, when uh, Ivan the Fourth uh, very much established um, uh, institutionalized serfdom uh, to prevent uh, many of the uh, peasants within the Oflichnina uh, uh, leaving uh, 
uh, you know, the, the the rather despotic rule of their new landowners, the uh, the officially the agents of the officially now, and uh, following their old lords, their old boyar lords, uh, into their new lands because there was a lot of um, land confiscation going on during that period. So they were essentially forced to become. Uh, feudal whole uh, feudal tenants of these newly created officially of these agents um so yes uh, that was the beginning of it and of course the officially was in many senses the beginning of russian autocracy uh, the russian had established the tsardom but in terms of complete power at the expense of the boyars we see it under ivan the fourth and we see an intensification you know what does why does boris goodenough um remove the right of the of the of the of the yuri day um rights of the peasants to uh, transfer their um, lordship again is to form an alliance between the russian autocracy and the nobility to subordinate the nobility to the autocracy so yes very much autocracy established it and autocracy abolished it um, i think that's that's a good way of putting it and i think alexander ii is very much right when he is anticipating this um, reform from above as opposed to reform from below which will ultimately uh, precede the emancipation of the serfs in 1863 uh, so interesting question. Thank you very much, Lady Shalot. Uh, now I'll try and go back through because uh, that's the end of the super chats. Um, unless there's a flurry of uh, super chats after this uh, to get to questions. The issue is I haven't really got questions framed. Uh, nice to see uh, Jonathan Paul in the chat. Hello. Uh, John, not real name. Uh, Crimea is Russia since it was Khrushchev that transferred the land. Um, I think Ukraine even had an independent chair uh, in the UN. I, I can't remember specifically about the independent chair in the UN. I'll have to look that up. But yes, it was essentially an arbitrary um, uh, land redistribution under under Khrushchev, which um, uh, one could argue was you know, remedied with the, the 1614 occupation but and re reintegration. But there you are. Um, right. Uh, if you do a Saturday or Sunday, I can appear on the Soviet lecture. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Jonathan Paul. I'd be very much honoured. Um, yes, and apparently they did have a seat in the UN General Assembly. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Paul. Yes, I'd be honoured um, if you wanted to do a, a Soviet lecture. Um, but don't worry, that won't be for many months <laughs> as things stand. I mean, we need to get through the Romanovs. We've only just started uh, before we get to the Soviets. Um, so uh, quite a lot of history to get through. Um, it was to put responsibility for the Crimean Tatar problem on Kiev. Interesting. I, I, I didn't know about that. Um, uh, thank you, Jonathan Paul. I'll have to look into that a little bit more. Right. Okay. Again, this is an invitation um, to, uh, again, as much an invitation to ask me questions, because it's gonna be quite difficult for me to go back through the chat and discern questions. So if you had any questions, please do um, uh, repeat them so I can find them easily. It's quite difficult to, um, to, to, to traverse through this ch chat. Um, Apostolic Majesty is such a historian and in the period that he thought Russia invaded and occupied Crimea in 1614. Did I say that? Um, 2014. Um, if I did say that again, I, I, I do get my, my centuries muddled up. I think when you're dealing with um, uh, so much history, you have to sort of forgive me that, um, especially as I don't tend to pick you know, one century and stick to it. Um, I, I do apologize um, profusely if that does happen. Um, and apparently I did, so so I, I do apologize. Um, right. By um, William James, um, I mean, the William James that comes to mind is William James and um, and uh. Foucault, if that is the, uh, and of course, Will Durant, um, the American writer and historian. Um, I don't know enough about them. Um, and again, I, I haven't got to the uh, the Peter the Great uh, chat yet. So um, 
I would ask to um, uh, to refrain from asking me about Peter the Great before we actually get to the um, <laughs> the Peter the Great uh, discussion. Just so, just questions relating to um, uh, this period of time. So anything from uh, 1581 until 1676. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, have you thought of posting bullet points on your lecture in Discord so people can come up with questions before the lecture starts? Um, I think that'll require me to be a lot more organized <laughs> um, than, than I really am. What, what, what my hope was uh, with the uh, lecture format and discussion format is that you would watch the lecture and then you have two, quite two days to... Um, to you know, find out or you know, ask uh, whatever questions um, uh, you want, and then you can answer it in the discussion portion um, to get around that to give you a, a bit of time. But in terms of actually uh, uh, giving my points beforehand, I'm really not um, that organised. <laughs> I'm afraid, uh, uh, Victor Vasquez. But thank you very much for the twenty dollars. It's um, it's very much appreciated, and I do understand that this is an oddity in the sense that this is a. Uh, a lecture without a discussion. So we're just going to have to make do, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, anyway, but of course there is required reading or not really required reading in the um, in the, in the uh, description. And I tend to put these um, uh, you know, thumbnails and the actual sort of stream a couple of days in advance. Uh, so you have time if you want to read through them and again, possibly ask um, ask questions. I think really in terms of my schedule, that's really the best I can do. Um, you know, maybe if I get more organized, I will um, do something on my Discord where I do put out my you know, research and my initial thoughts. But but again, I, I really am not, not, not that very organized. Um, Persian Ambassador, uh, do you have any knowledge on the process of orthodoxy uh, spreading east uh, during, Russian, uh, during Russia's grave? Uh, how do the locals take to it? Uh, orthodoxy uh, versus Tengrinism. I mean, that is something which I have absolutely no knowledge of whatsoever, I'm afraid. I mean, Siberian history, other than just skirting around to the, uh, the basic details. I mean, from my understanding, the Siberian Khanate um, was mainly Muslim rather than Tengri. Um, you know, when we're talking about actual sort of believers of Tengrinism, uh, if that's, you know, because Tengrinism isn't really a bona fide religion, as you know, a series of customs, you know, relating to the steppe peoples and their worship of the sky god. But um, I, I'm not sure, you know, what the the interaction would have been. Um, and again, we're not talking about you know millions of people in Siberia. We're talking about tens of thousands, um, most of which were killed off due to um, smallpox, etc. So I'm not actually sure, uh, but that's that's an interesting question, though, Persian ambassador, about the uh, the implications of orthodox uh, converts via Tengrinism. But when it comes to the uh, Khanate of uh, Crimea, uh, sorry, of, of Siberia, uh, that was basically a um, a split off from the the Shaibanids, the dynasty which ruled over Bukhara. Um, so ostensibly, I believe the leadership would have been Muslim. Um, I'll just verify that, actually, so I could be totally accurate. Um, but no, uh, very interesting question. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't um, offer a, um, a more interesting uh, response. But yes, uh, the Kuchum Khan, who was the, the last Khan, um, was, a, um, was a Muslim. Um, and Jonathan Pohl in the chat is saying that... Uh, uh, most Tengrists uh, converted to either uh, uh, Buddhism or Islam. So yes, uh, Buddhism obviously um, in the east around the old um, Turkestan region and uh, you know, the bordering between the later Qing dynasty and the Russian Empire. Uh, but yes, in the Khanate of Siberia, which is uh, we're talking about a rather specific region um, in Western Siberia, which was later you know, referred to all of um, uh, Siberia, but originating around the city of Tyumen, uh, which is relatively near to Bolsk, um, was essentially Muslim and inhabited. Um, but but again, I'm glossing over the fact that you know, Siberia is such a huge area, uh, which is incredibly diverse in terms of its um, uh, local tribes and peoples. And um, I'm sure the way that the Russians interacted with each of them um, would have been different. 
in terms of trying to assimilate this. You know, this really is a whole lecture stream uh, in its own right. Uh, <laughs> And uh, as Harry Tentacle is saying, uh, Siberia was a dark colony uh, since there was no naval route. Uh, nobody probably knows what happened there. Uh, yes, again, it's, it's it's the complete sort of opposite of what we see with the expansion of the American West, uh, where it's land which was um, occupied relatively quickly. You're taken off after the uh, the American-Mexican War in the um, the 1840s, and then progressively colonized and Americanized uh, throughout the remainder of the 19th century. And we see the expansion of the railroads, but of course, um, the situation in, in Siberia uh, was essentially a series of outposts uh, conducting trades of fur and trades of tea. But um, in terms of its actual population and its strategic significance, it uh, wasn't really felt until the 19th century, uh, wherein it became the launch pad for you know, Russia's expansion into Central Asia into what is now known as Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, etc., and of course expanding at the expense of China in Outer Manchuria. Um, but like I said, this is all sort of t topics for another conversation, and I'm not particularly equipped to um, uh, to answer it. All right, uh, John, and again, this is before the Trans-Siberian Railway, and, and again, even during the construction of the Trans-Siberian um, Expressway, uh, linking Port Arthur and Vladivostok uh, to um, uh, to the west. We're only talking about a couple of cities um, in the south, which would have been linked beyond that to the north. Uh, Siberia, even today, is still um, relatively inaccessible. Um, John, not real name. Was Russia all that harsh at the time, or was it just exaggerated? Also, is the backwardness of the Russians comparable to Western Europe or no? Uh, well, like I said, this is um, uh, something which uh, the Tsars from really Tsar Ivan the Terrible uh, were cognizant of, the idea that, um, especially in military technology, uh, the Russians lagged behind the West and um, needed um, Western advisors in order to reform their military. And the effect of all of these suddenly... Um, and no longer employed military advisors from the Thirty Years' War, meant that many of them flurried to Russia. Uh, there were many foreign districts, especially around Moscow, and indeed Scottish um, advisors uh, went over and, um, and, and supported the, uh, the nascent sort of modernization efforts of the Russian army before Peace the Great. Um, and of course, we mentioned the, uh, the Volga Germans and the, the Lutherans, um, the Lutheran Germans established uh, by Boris Gudunov. So there was this conscious need, this this need to pragmatically associate with the West um, in order to modernize the army, but also to retain the uh, continuity with Russia's orthodox heritage and maintain Russia as the center of orthodoxy. Indeed, uh, apparently the the, the 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 theological and sort of political source of salvation. But they were. Uh, why were Eastern kingdoms like Hungary uh, not able to shake off the serfs, um, to shake off the serfs like the Russians? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, not able to shake off the serfs like the Russians? Um, well, I think that's because serfdom in Hungary, you know, sort of manifested itself in different ways in terms of the fact that what we see in Russia is that when you have an elected monarchy um, like that of Gudunov or like that of uh, Shvisky, um, the only exception to this was uh, the false Dmitri, whose reign was essentially a, a coup d'état uh, based on this assumption that he actually was the um, the uh, Dmitri Rudish, the, uh, uh, the illegitimate son of Ivan the Terrible. Um, but if you mean check off the serfs like the Russians, I mean, do you mean, I, I mean, it's not that the serfs were um, controlling Hungary in any fashion. It was rather that the Hungarian nobility was much more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the king uh, compared to the autocracy in Russia. And serfdom was an institution which had a longer history in Hungary. And the magnates, again, were you know, comparatively much more powerful. And Hungary, um, most of its kings uh, were elected um, after, you know, you can say the fall of the Angevin dynasty in Hungary. Um, 
and thereafter not not only that were the kings elected but often the kings weren't resident uh, like Sigismund and the Habsburgs and Ladislaus. Uh, when you look at the last sort of great king of an independent Hungary, um, it's Matthias Corvinus, um, who was, again, trying to establish a dynasty, albeit unsuccessfully, and was resident in Budapest. Uh, Polish ambassador. It's pretty weird how much China was shocked uh, by a century of shame, given that they bored with one of those countries, Russia. Surely Russia wasn't that much behind them to make them not expect anything. Um, again, sort of what do you mean by that? I mean, do you mean that the Russian buildup was expected? Um, because when we look at the century of shame, it wasn't instigated. Um, it wasn't instigated by the Russians. It was instigated by the British and, and followed up by the French. The Russians simply took advantage of the fact that um, the Chinese were so weak. And during the Second Opium War, so this is a around 1860, um, one Russian general, I forget his name, uh, submitted an ultimatum uh, to Beijing, uh, basically demanding that, you know, you give us land, you give us out of Manchuria, which would later become the, the basis of Vladivostok, ruler of the East, and uh, we will not declare war on you. Um, so, again, it's you, you can't sort of look at the century of humiliation as being sort of Russian instigated because it simply wasn't. If anything, you know, the Russians were simply uh, advancing their interests in line with the precedents set by other imperial powers. Um, like, like I said, mainly at the instigation of the English and the French. The French, you know, establishing their influence along the Pearl River, along Guangzhou, Canton, and the British were establishing their influence in Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, the Yangtze uh, River Valley. So, yeah. Right. Oh, oh, no, no. My point is that technological shock was uh, so huge to them, and yet they technologically bordered one of the European superpowers. Uh, just from trade, they should expect what uh, Europe could do with the weaponry. Well, again, um, I, I'm not sort of, again, the Russian the Russian army, um, especially at this time, so we're talking about the Crimean War, still lagged considerably behind the, uh, the British and the French. Uh, that was demonstrated uh brutally uh, with the Crimean war um and, and again when we look at the the at the advantages of weaponry i mean what really seriously sort of transformed the nature of war um was the adventation of the machine gun which is slightly after this period um you know the british had complete naval supremacy and they were able to dominate the oceans um but rather i'd say russia i mean russia had armaments russia had artillery russia had um uh arquebuses you know russia had sorry sorry china and china had been at war for the entire century for the entire 18th century the glorious campaigns of uh, the emperor Qianlong. Uh, so it wasn't that they were unfamiliar with the um the methods of fighting i would argue rather that after the death of Qianlong, so we're talking around the year 1800 uh china entered the period of political collapse and massive corruption uh, meaning that russia uh, that china simply could not organize armies capable of countering the West. And um, there was a desire after the 1860s to begin a technological catch up. It was called the self-strengthening movement. Um, but yes, that, that's a very sort of long winded way to, uh, uh, yes, to, um, and yes, uh, the Gatling gun was not a machine gun in the strictest sense, but I'm talking about uh, rapid fire and the, uh, the progression uh, to machine gun. Yes, thank you for, um, for, for correcting me on that, uh, John, not real name. Right. Yes, China was actually really competent pre 19th century. Yes. I mean, um, during the 18th century, China expanded rapidly and created the internal empire. Um, so it's wrong to think that China was just a complete pushover. Um, maybe it was in the naval you know, sphere, but definitely not in the land sphere. And again, I think it was a political collapse, which facilitated, and you know, a reduction of power of the court to um, the area around Beijing. Uh, which you know, reduced its ability to really deal with, you know, the, the, the problems with dealing with such a massive empire. But again, I want to emphasize, emphasize that this isn't a uh, 19th century history stream. Uh, this is a stream dedicated to uh, the Russian history of the 17th century. So please um, uh, rededicate your questions towards uh, that topic. I'll just um, go through the other chats to see if there are any interesting questions asked earlier. Right. Anyway, no, 
Um, okay, I think that's the end for um, for questions. So yes, all I can say really is um, thank you all for listening and um, putting up with me uh, rambling on about this subject. Um, so other than that, um, thank you to all my patrons for making this content possible. In terms of the schedule uh, for the next couple of weeks, on Monday, um, instead of the typical um, discussion portion, uh, we will be having the Tolkien series, the Ardoranye. I'll be going over the law. I have had been, been having some trouble in terms of um, uh, just organizing what the purpose and what the sort of the idea essentially is of doing, you know, a, a real history of a fictional history. Um, because again, it is something which has eluded me before. Uh, but you know, it'd be interesting to try with this experimental new structure because, of course, this isn't a, a talking law channel. I have no interest in it, just become a talking law channel. So, um, I will experiment it with experiment with this new uh, format on Monday and see how it goes. Um, then they'll be followed up by the discussion portion of that on Friday. Um, from what I understand, Mr. Pajarak is going through quite a difficult time at the moment, so I'm not sure whether he'll be able to attend that. Probably most likely had not. And the week after, when we return to Orthodoxy, Orthodoxy, Nationality, we will be discussing the Sultanate of Women, question mark, um, the political transformation of the Ottoman Empire after the death of Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, and that definitely will have a discussion part. Uh, we have Semi Goron uh, to talk about that, our, um, our resident Turkophile, so very lucky to have him. Thank you all very much for listening. Uh, do you know like and comment or whatever? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I really don't um, enjoy this uh, shilling thing. I hope it doesn't sort of come across as uh, completely indifferent and lacking all enthusiasm. But uh, thank you all so much. Regardless, it really does help. Uh, thank you all and good night. <laughs>